What's Hello. up with you? Look at you. You got fucking suntan. <laughs> I know. I never get suntan. You're the only went to the Jew beach. goes to the beach without SPF. We had it. We just didn't use it. You got to use it. Next thing you know, you want to sue the fucking sun. <laughs> You oh, use this through anyway. Can you imagine calling a personal injury lawyer? How you doing? The son, I want to sue him. I want to take him. Exactly. I think you got a case. You can a make case this happen. Shit. How's your back? I, just, I was wearing a shirt. We were. Uh, we did. You didn't uh, take your shirt off on the beach. No, we didn't go to the beach. We went to. Uh, she got us uh, like a Groupon for one of those paddle bikes, like kind of what Water Boxer does, except it's like a bike you sit on. So we just went around the marina. It was fun. I know you think I'm crazy, but it was a Marina Del Rey. You said I got to deal with them. You said yeah, deal I see. With I see what you're doing. I see. It's a fucking amazing <laughs> you're, thing. You're a strong man, Joey. He couldn't go into the ocean. <laughs> he could take a shirt with a fucking paddleboard about the fucking Marina. And there was no sharks there when I needed them. <laughs> Next time you're doing that, let me know. I'll put tuna fish in your pocket, <laughs> cocksucker, and I'll call fucking the Jaws, whatever his name is. Tuna fish. <laughs> What's up so with man. you, player? Man, just chilling. Just came from work, and I'm just headed. If traffic was easy, I thought it was going to be worse. And I just made it here, and I'm glad to be here, man. And I like fucking with Joey Diaz. I fucked with you. Good, good, good. <laughs> no, no, no. That's tremendous. Now, do you shoot every week, or are you just writing the six episodes right uh, now? We're just writing the six right now. And we're going to start shooting in a few weeks. And we should be done by, let's say, July. And it's going to air in August. And, uh, yeah, it should be fun. we over at the Fox lot and just, How just fucking niggas on the Fox lot. How fucking <laughs> great is it to walk on the Fox lot? Especially for me. I got felonies. As soon as I walk in, they're like, how you doing, Mr. Diaz? And you're like, if these motherfuckers knew. <laughs> if they knew and shit, so you're like, mingling, <laughs> eating with people, right? Yeah, they have eat. no idea. They have no fucking idea. Yeah. They got shrimp out and ham and cheese sandwiches, <laughs> and there you are mingling, <laughs> taking shit, housing yeah. things. It's funny because they had uh, like the peanut gang characters like walking around during lunch times. They're taking photos with them. And they, like I don't know who's in the costume, and they don't know who they're taking photos with. So it's fuck it. It's like it's whatever. Just it's have great fun. to just walk around the fire. And it's my favorite lot is Paramount. That's the one where I walk on the lot and I'm like, damn. Right. I can't believe they let me in there <laughs> without a fucking security guy on me. Like, I'm just walking the fucking around. Like, it's, it's, uh, I remember the first audition I went to was on the Fox lot. Mm -hmm. And I had to walk to the other motherfucking end because mm -hmm. the, the, the building that belongs to the dude who wrote NYPD Blue. Right. At that time, that motherfucker had a building. Damn. But it was all the way at the end. And you don't know. You got a shirt on, Lee. That sun's beating. Lots are huge, yeah. That's a hot lot. That's a hot lot. That, that's a sun. That's like a equator lot. The sun hits that shit like no, all over. No, I'm going to tell you what the hottest lot is. What? Sony. Sony? Really? It's, yeah. Culver City. Right there. Century City. Culver mm -hmm. City. Yeah. On uh, what street is that? Uh, it Venice? Runs Washington Culver? or something yeah, like that. Yeah, Washington. Culver. That lot, dog, I had a fucking, the old, see, in the old days, they would let you park and then walk around the lot, cross over, and you're right there. Mm -hmm. I think after 9-11, they'd make you cross on that side, make right. you cross across Washington and go through. So I was used to that easy pimp shit, right. and all of a sudden they switched it on my ass <laughs> in the hottest day of fucking April, uh -huh. like a March, you know, one of those hot days that happens in L.A., uh -huh. I have a black velour mafia wow. sweatsuit on, <laughs> pants fucking, with no underwear on, and I can feel the balls dripping on the velour. You're just dripping by the time you get Oh, to my God, office. and I got to that audition, and it was for Spider-Man 2. Oh, shit. I'll never forget that. I was drenched, and I got in there, and there was 30 gangsters in there, and I'm like, I'm not getting this. I don't even know where I'm staying. This is a waste of my fucking time. But I got so wound up and so scared from looking at these motherfuckers mm -hmm. that I just went in there and got it. You went in like, there. I just stole it. Like, said, fuck it. I am not letting these motherfuckers fuck it. take it from I me. I sweat all the way here. Fuck this. Oh, my God. I was sweating profusely, dog. <laughs> it might be a little bit different for you, Joey, because you went on auditions. But, like, Ian, how many times did you walk by the Fox, drive by the Fox a lot? And now you're like, it must be crazy. Like, that's, I worked in TV for a few years. And the uh -huh. only, I worked on, Sunset and Gower lot, which is gross. Like, I never got to work on, like, a nice, like, Fox, CB, like, one of those lots. That's, like, the one thing I wish I had done. It, it's, it's always kind of amazing. The thing about the Paramount lot you mentioned, I remember, like, walking on that lot with Hugh Moore. You know Hugh Moore? Yeah. Comic? He's from New yeah, York. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know Hugh Moore. Okay. And then, you know, Paramount has that big blue backdrop, like, just sitting on the lot. And they shoot things there or up against it. And then one day we was walking there. I forgot why we were there. We weren't. I think we were about to... to interview for jobs some writing jobs and he said it's a beautiful day isn't it i said what do you mean and he's like any day you could walk on the paramount lot is a beautiful day 
And I was like, oh, shit, he's right. We're winning right now, whether we get these jobs or not. Because this is what we came here to do. And, like, we were in the vicinity of it. So I was like, all right, cool. You know, I really like you. I always liked you because you're a gentleman. So, and Lee, I love. I could tell you this with fucking, there's not too many things that bring me pleasure in life. Mm-hmm. I can't lie to you. Most of the time I'm sitting there going, where's the gun? You know what I'm saying? Like, uh-huh. where's the fucking gun? Nothing gets my dick harder. <laughs> when I look at that audition, and it says I got to go to Paramount, Fox, Sony, uh-huh. Gow a lot. That's disgusting. You're absolutely right. Uh, Sunset, not Sunset Gow, but yeah, even Sunset Gow. Well, there's two of them on like the same road. Hannah Montana. The yeah. Tribune lot. Yeah, it's a fucking nightmare. I worked over there. It's a shitty lot. Shitty yeah. lot. Yeah. But when you're a felon and you've been in prison and uh-huh. You don't have a fucking agent. Nobody wants to manage you. Right. The only person who's giving you spots is Mitzi Shaw. Right. And all of a sudden, here you want a lot to go read for fucking, you know, Chaz Palm and Terry or something. Mm-hmm. Nobody has an idea. Like, I remember being up till two, you know, getting it down. And right. Just when you walk in that lot, you're like, fuck, if these people knew that <laughs> half the shit I did, they wouldn't let me on this lot. <laughs> well, describe what you see, because, like, a lot of people do, like, don't know what, like, lots are like. It's like... Huge buildings, and they have signs everywhere, and you see like s- reserved for like stars, like all over the place. It's just it's producers, it's, and, and there's you know, there's sh- sh- things shooting. Yeah, it's like the history of shit you've seen your entire life things that you thought you'd never be near, and you're there, and it just kind of blows your mind. Like, I didn't know I'd get this close. Have any have either of you ever worked on like a stage that had like a really cool show that you used to watch? It's funny because you guys mentioned that I was doing uh, Two and a Half Men, and they, I was just basically an extra a couple of years ago with Ashton Kutcher when uh, we were dancing on the street. Right. Mm-hmm. And it was boring as fuck, man. <laughs> and you know me, I always bring 22 joints with me. I don't care what <laughs> lot I'm on. That's an understatement. And during lunch, I'll watch something. They, uh-huh. they got you on camera, so you got to make believe you're smoking a cigarette and then double fist it. But uh, I was smoking a dube one day. It was raining or something. That's why I knew they wouldn't catch me. Uh-huh. And I went to one of those coves, and I'm smoking, and I'm halfway done with the joint. I look, and it said it had a list on the wall of what shows. So yeah, yeah. They yeah. shot I Love Lucy there. Mm-hmm. I put that joint out so fucking quick <laughs> out of respect. <laughs> out of respect. <laughs> Where Steve Byrne shot his show. Remember, he tweeted yeah. all the shows they had yeah. shot there. Yeah, there's something to that. Yeah, there is yeah. something to that. There's something to that. It, it gives you, you can't. It's something relatable to it because no matter where you were in the world, you were watching this thing, and now you're where this thing was shot, and it, it does strike you a little bit, at least a little bit. It gets you a little bit. It's always fucked with me. I mm-hmm. just don't let it take over. Right. I just make believe like it's not happening. Mm-hmm. Like being like at a table reading, there's other people in the room, and right. you just gotta act like you know this ain't happening. Right. <laughs> this motherfucker. This is, is normal. Not, this guy is not standing ten yeah. feet from me. I watch this guy kill a motherfucker in this movie and this movie and this uh-huh. movie. It's really fucking surreal. I, 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 I don't even know how to describe it to people. I can't because I'm embarrassed. <laughs> I'd rather tell you a story about stabbing somebody than uh-huh. telling you a story if about that's easier. being on a lot next to this guy and what I was going through. The hardest lot I was ever on was shooting a movie with Dick Van Dyke. That, Damn. that old motherfucker with fucking little balls under his eyes and shit. He's old. <laughs> I couldn't keep it together at all. <laughs> at no point could I, could I keep it together. I was crying. Damn. Every time I looked at him, I had to put my head down. <laughs> until finally, I was like, why is this fucking guy crying, bro? He's a big fucking dude. What's the problem? Uh-huh. I had to tell him what happened. <laughs> he must go through that a lot, though. That must happen all the time. Like, do you think if, like, Tom Cruise does a movie, it probably takes him a couple days to calm, like, all the rest of the actors down? Like, it must. You know, I don't know. What happened with De Niro and Stallone? I just say hello. But, it, like, it wasn't... Maybe it was because they were already, like, into the movie. But, like, it must be crazy, like, getting to work with... You just say them. hello. You go like that with your hand, and someone will come over and give you their hand and say, nice to meet you, and you say, yeah, and then they ask you a question. You ask them a question, and at the end of the night, you go home. I don't talk unless I'm spoken to. Right. You know, that's what I was taught. I don't reach out. But you really love you. Yeah, I don't try to... Where'd you get that motivation from? I don't right. say dick. Right. How are you doing? Good. Yeah, yeah. You ready for this? Yeah, I am. I just right. try to have a good, normal time and not fuck it up. Right. Yeah, yeah. that's it. That's all. The, you yeah. know. That's all you're saying to yourself when you're here. Just don't fuck it up. You not, not, not even. You just like, all right, just be normal, Ian. Hi. Do my thing. And then if they want to talk some more, you know, but, oh, okay. And then, and then I'm out. There's some motherfuckers I don't want to see. Mm-hmm. 
because I would have a nervous breakdown. There's certain motherfuckers. Damn. One of them would definitely be Muhammad Ali. Really? Like, remember when we at the store? I don't know. How long <laughs> you been out here now? Uh, in Cali? I've been out here since, like, 2000, around 2000, uh, yeah. Like, three or four years before that, I was at the store. Mm-hmm. And do you remember at the store, Lila Lee used to hang yeah, out there? Yeah, one like, of his daughters. Yeah, one was, of his daughters. Yeah, she a, comes around once in a while. Was a comic. Yeah. And I left one night, and two days later, they told me, dog, she came up here with Muhammad Ali. And I remember going, like, wow, and then going, I don't really, really want to see Muhammad Ali. <laughs> I would have a nervous breakdown. I would start Thought crying. About yeah, how, you know, how would you act around Muhammad Ali? I, I, I don't know how I would fucking act. Mm-hmm. I don't know how I would act. I know I'd lose. I'd have to hug him. Mm-hmm. I'd have to hug him after a few fucking minutes. Yeah, you got to hug the champ. You got to hug him. Yeah. This, I'd hug Pete Rose. Yeah. Red Band said he saw him at the Glendale Mall looking uh-huh. lonely as a motherfucker. Oh, I'd shake his hand. Yeah, I would go I up like to I like that Pete. dude. Yeah, me too. I would go up to Fuck Pete baseball. Rose. That Skechers commercial made me laugh where he wasn't allowed to be in the hall like his wife yelled at him. <laughs> I don't know. I hope, I hope he gets taken back. They're really campaigning for it now. Yeah. Some, something is going on. It's, it's crazy how quick we get like used to things. Like I was thinking about it as I was leaving tonight. I was like, I'm headed to work and a year and a half ago I would have been hating life and like, worried until I was going to get home and now I'm going to have fun and get high with Joey and, and, and Ian and that's your job and it's my job that's and dope. it's just so it's like yeah you guys have been on a ton of lots and it's just but it's to someone 20 years ago or to someone back in New Jersey or New York mm-hmm. they must just lose their mind dog if you would have told me 25 years ago I was going to walk on the Paramount lot I would have spit your fucking like face. you have a favorite <laughs> lot can you think about like that's crazy oh they got good food <laughs> I could mingle on that. Oh line. shit! One time, <laughs> you know Patrice. Yeah, please. <laughs> one time, Patrice. This is a few years. This is before he died. Maybe like three years before he died. We were driving around Hollywood. He he was in town. We had some meetings, and then we was driving around Hollywood. We were gonna go get something to eat. Then, in the middle of Hollywood, there was this lot. Maybe around, not maybe around like a uh, vineish. There's this lot, and it was set up for like food, like for like a shoot you know and it was lunchtime, and then we just like i dare you that we should go over there and go get something to eat and he's like bet let's do it and then we pulled on with the car said some bullshit to the security guy we drove on and then we got online <laughs> at the catering shit and then we got some food and we sat down with the extras and started eating and then i think it was like one of those TNT shows like Law and Order, and he knew one of the, the main actors from the show, so then we moved from the extras to sit over there and <laughs> eat with them. And we, we could have paid for lunch somewhere, but it was just more fun to just fuck around and do this thing. And we had lunch, and then, <laughs> then we bounced. I never had the and we got some And that. we got some numbers <laughs> from some of the, the, actor, the <sighs> extra chicks, because they use hot extras. Free lunch, numbers, because everybody thinks y'all doing the same shit. And then they noticed that, People were paying like Patrice attention more to, attention, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, it's and then we we had more freedom than them because this didn't mean nothing to us. If we got kicked out, it was just gonna add to the story. So we were just looser, and they were just on their best behavior. Like, who's these loose dudes? <laughs> I would never have the balls to do that. Just the thing of getting thrown really? out, really, and somebody saying they threw Joe Diaz out. He tried to get a lunch. I would fucking have a heart attack. Everything you've done, and you yeah, can't do that. You can't oh, take a there's, lunch. There's a lot of things. Is like that where you draw the line? <laughs> yeah, it's funny, man. Yeah. That's fucking crazy. No, I don't have the balls to do it. I couldn't get away with it. We just thought the shit would be fun. Man. It is fucking fun. That is hysterical. It was, it was, we just thought it would be fun. That's we like going to somebody's party day. when you ain't invited. Yeah, yeah. Those That's are like the best driving parties. by. Yeah, it's like driving by and seeing a party. Let's take a chance. Let's go in there. You know, you got a bag of weed. Just tell me we got weed. Let's see what happens. <laughs> they let you in. When people see you with a drug, they let you in. Oh, he's all right. He What's belongs in this party. Who sent you here? Who invited you? I don't know. We're Drugs. The, we went to the supermarket. <laughs> 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 now, how long have you been doing comedy? Uh, like over 20 years. That's what I tell people. Now, you're a great writer. Mm-hmm. But how did you get into the other side of, of the writing? Like, how long have you been doing that? I was doing stand-up, and then uh, one time... We was in New York. I started in New York, and uh, and uh, this guy, Rick Dorfman, he used to be a manager under Barry Katz, had his own company. He was running Gotham at the time, and he said, hey, they're auditioning for writers for Keenan Ivory Wayans' talk show. And uh, he was like, do you want to come down and do a set for this lady, and she'll determine if you're good enough to be a writer on the show? I was like, all right, bet. You know, and then uh, 
I went down there that night and I was hot back then. Like I had a set that was getting standing O's if I did it. Like it was a hot 10. Like I'd, I'd thrown away all my old shit, started working on this thing at the Boston Comedy Club and like built it up. And, it, and then there was a point where I was worried. I was doing the Boston so much I wasn't even doing black clubs. But then we had this uh, black comedy con- competition in Jersey and I drove all my friends there that night we, I, par- I was looking for parking. They all jumped in, out the car, ran into the contest venue, wrote their names down. And when I walked in, they was like, we all signed up. So then I signed up last. And I said, you motherfuckers, I drove you here. I got to drive you back home. And you didn't sign my name on the list. So I'm last. So everybody goes. It's a hot show. Everybody does good. And I stand them with my 10. I said, oh, shit, this shit works anywhere. This is dope. So then I got on Def Comedy Jam with that set. And I also did that set for this lady at the Gotham. And uh, she was like, you got any writing samples? I was like, yeah, I got some writing samples. And I had some ideas written down and I had some completely written out. And the only reason why I had them completely written out is a few years earlier, a homeboy of mine, another comic, Arnold Acevedo. I don't know if you know Arnold Acevedo. He's a Puerto Rican dude. He's from Westbury, Long Island. And we used to do a lot of shows together. And we all hung out. and we. You know, after our shows, we used to just hang out on the corner and just talk and just laugh for hours. You know what I'm saying? And I don't know how the topic came up, but he was like, yeah, man, I got 362 sketches. And I'm like, what? You got 362 sketches? Like, why? He said, just in case if I get a job on SNL, I don't have to come up with a new sketch every week. I got sketches. And I was like, oh, shit. I don't have no sketches. I'm like, how the fuck am I going to get 300 and something sketches? And I was like, calm down, Ian. I panicked at first inside. I'm just pretending to still be in this conversation with these dudes we're having fun with. But on the inside, I'm panicked because I'm like, I'm unprepared for this comedy life or for the possibilities that this thing could branch out into. And I was like, calm down. Just whenever you always have ideas, but you just never write them down. You promise to write them down. You never do. So next time you have an idea, either write the go home write it down on a piece of paper go home and completely finish it or at least jot it down so that you don't forget it and then it'll accumulate up to uh and then i calmed down so then i started doing that and then this opportunity came along years later and it was like 2000 or 99 so i had to i went home that night finished like six sketches i had three wrote three and faxed them in and then it was like and it was like december mid-december and I waited to hear from him for like two weeks. And he's like, you got the job. Come out here in January. And I just came out and did the shit. And then the show got canceled three months later. <laughs> Poor Keith. <laughs> yeah. And you've been here ever since. Yeah. I, you know, the first few years here, like the first three years, I like, I love New York so much. I'm like New York. You know, I love New York. And you, you don't want, when you, once you're from New York, you're proud of that title. I'm from New York, you know, and uh, I was here. So I spent I spent most of my time in New York, even though I had an apartment here. And then I said to myself, Ian, you got to be in L.A. to do the shit you want to do. You can't like be in New York just doing what you used to. You have an apartment in L.A. and you came there. And I and I and I decided to stay because one night. After the show got canceled, me and Hugh Moore was driving around because he was writing on a, on a, the show that Chris Spencer had that Sinbad took over, and we so we were writing on c- competitive shows and we were both from New York, and uh, we was playing Mob Deep in the car one night, and then there was a line in the song that I never paid attention before, and Hugh Moore repeated it. He said, "Scared money don't make money," and that was the sign from God or the universe to say stay in LA because when the show got canceled there was like three weeks left on my contract and there's a guaranteed contract up to a certain amount of weeks and then so then I got paid nine thousand dollars for free right so I had so I had like nine thousand dollars plus whatever money I was making in comedy in New York so maybe I had twelve thousand dollars the most amount of money I ever had in my life And I was like, I can go back to New York and do shows and I'll definitely get shows because I always was getting shows and I could add to the $12,000 or I can scared money, don't make no money, get an an apartment here, pay rent, 
and stay here and see if I can get another writing job, which I have no connections to anybody, but I just have a feeling if I stick around, if I stick around, things I'll get happen. jobs. Things, yeah, will happen. things will happen. So then I just did that. I just listened to the Mob Deep li- lyric and then I, I just stayed. And did Sometimes that. a sign. Yeah. I, I live on signs too, yeah. man. Always have mm-hmm. something sways me. I don't know. It's I, I came out here on the same thing. I came out here to shoot a pilot, mm-hmm. shot the pilot, didn't get picked up. Right. I had a choice, and I said, well, if I shot a pilot, let's see what else we can boogie. I'll give it six more months. Mm-hmm. Got a Taco Bell commercial. Gave it a little more time. Got this, got mm-hmm. that, and you fucking stay. You know? right. You're like, what the fuck am I doing somewhere else? I only My tenure in New York was maybe four or five months in 94. Mm. I was terrible. <laughs> terrible. I was at the New York Comedy Club with Al. Oh, shit. I went down to Boston, and you motherfuckers scared me down there on 4th Street. <laughs> Dave Chappelle was there. Oh, it Jay was, Moore. It was tough. And I just said, get me the fuck out of here. <laughs> Nick DiPaolo was down on a Monday yeah. night. I was like, I don't belong here. And then I went to, uh, but my club was in New York. I fucked with Lucian a little bit. He Comp pissed shit. me off. And I fucked with the dude, the other one that was, he was supposed to get a deal from Warner Brothers. Whatever happened to those fools? The guy on like 76th Street in the West Side. That's uh, that him and his wife. I know you're talking about. Remember? God damn it. Yeah, they called me one night. Stand up New York. Stand up New York. The old owners called me one night and said, "There's a big thing going on in New York. You should fly back this week. Josh will fly back." And did the festival for them for free and the mm-hmm. something with a festival they were trying to start that all this industry was going to be there. It just sounded too kinky to me. <laughs> And then I'd see him at the comedy store, Al something. No, no, no. They always say him and his wife, right? Carol, I, I know you're talking about. I just taught can't classes remember classes there right or something. Mm-hmm. They did something there. Fucking crazy. That was a... But New York was what kick-started my career because right. I saw something. I saw John Leguizamo doing time at yeah, old Triple N. Mm-hmm. This old dump on like the... The, the, in Hell's Kitchen, and they started their open mic at midnight right. in 93. Fucking midnight. Who starts to open mic at midnight? But they're like, people are like, yeah, there's like eight people there. I went in there, it was just drunk motherfuckers uh-huh. trying to get dollar fifty beers or something. And there's comics on stage, and I'm like, this isn't what I signed up for. Right. At that age, at that time, I didn't know this was it. Mm-hmm. I didn't know this was what you did. So I never went back. And then I read something, or I talked to somebody at the club, and they're like, yeah, man, you got to go to those places. That's where you bomb. And I went down there. I was driving a limo, uh-huh. and I went to Kennedy Airport, and on the way back, I stopped in there, and I seen John Leguizamo on stage, and I said, I got it. Uh-huh. All right, I'm going to pack my bags, go back to Colorado, and work on this shit. Mm-hmm. And that's when I really, really got serious about it. Oh, so you went to Colorado. I didn't know that. I started in Denver. Oh, shit, I didn't know that. I started in Denver in 91, but I was, like, selling drugs. And right. Was getting my dick sucked. I was doing <laughs> open mic on Tuesdays. I was the host. All I had to do was five minutes, and I could do blow and sell pills at this place. So <laughs> I took it seriously, but I didn't. Like, right. I was just... I was just killing time. I had just come out of prison. Mm-hmm. I couldn't, I had a felony. I didn't know what I wanted to do, but this seemed attractive. I didn't know about that traveling. Right, and right. Being on the road like Bob Seger and shit. Fuck you. Sleeping in hotels. <laughs> I like my bed. But, right. but then people said, this is what you got to do. You got to travel. You got to do this. You got to do that. This is what needs to be done. So, yeah, I just, I just didn't want to do a regular job. And so that's, that's where it appealed to me. I, I, didn't, I didn't mind the travel, I might mind it now. But I know it's necessary. I'm, I'm going to have to do a bunch of traveling to get this thing to where I want it to get to. You know what I mean? To be just so independent that I can call my own shots. So I'm down. Depending on what career you want right. to have. You have a great career, but you also have something else. You're also very funny. Mm-hmm. And uh, for you to take over this motherfucker like you're supposed to. Mm-hmm. You got to get allies. Right. So you got to go to every state and get one representative. <laughs> from Dania Edwards this is the baddest motherfucker, smoothest black dude working right now. Uh-huh. My nomination. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Fuck Billy D. Williams. He's done. It's hilarious. And little by little, bam, bam, bam. And all of a sudden you have these little ports that got you. It's like when you these presidents. Isn't the big thing fucking Iowa? Yeah. They get the signs like fucking Momos and they're out there. A bunch <laughs> of white people vote for this fucking idiot. Same thing with stand-up. Right. We got to get out there. Right. It's hard. It's rough on your family. It's rough on you at a certain age. But it's also fun. Right. It's rough 
till you get to your hotel room. Right. And now you go into work mode. Now you go into animal mode. You know, right. this is where I am. Last time I was here, I got my dick sucked. I went to this place. They got good wings. Let's talk about those wings. Let's talk <laughs> about the dirty hoes in this town. <laughs> Let's talk about this. Let's talk about that. And now you become a bond with that town, and you keep building. This time you go, you sell three hundred tickets. The next time it's four fifty. Mm-hmm. The next time now you haven't been there a year and a half. So now you're gonna double up and get eight hundred tickets. Right. You ready for a small theater? Now you got to go back and get that hump over. Now right. you're ready for a, a thousand seater, and this is it. But I don't. I was talking to Josh Wolf this morning, mm-hmm. and he was asking me how I felt, and I told him, for me right now at this part of my life, I didn't think I'd be doing this, Ian. Right. I didn't think I'd be picking up my packages and going to Salt Lake City and to Denver and to Boston. But this is it. Right. This is what we signed up for. Whether you're 52 or 22, this right. is what you signed up for. So I've fallen in love with it right. again I, because of the social media aspect of it. Right. I'm seeing motherfuckers. I communicate with an Avalon. What do they call that shit? Avatar. Avatar. Avalon, Avatar, <laughs> whatever the fuck it is. And all of a sudden, there they are in front of you shaking your motherfucking hand. So the experience came through. Right. It really came full circle, this thing that started on a fucking wire. This is on a wire. We're doing this whole show on a fucking wire. Right. This is a wire. We have put our videos on this fucking wire. 20 years ago, a comic, Richard Pryor couldn't go home and put his set up in the comedy store on a wire. Right. If you're serious about this game, you could put your set up every night on the fucking YouTube. Right. And it's the same thing as going on the road. You're picking up allies. That's a different avenue. Right. You know, you do a Comedy Central special. Comedy Central airs it Friday twice and, that's and it. once on Sunday. And then and what are you going to go backwards and go on Showtime? Who has Showtime? Who has showtime? Said, who has showtime? Yeah, <laughs> fucking people who are perverts that want the whole thing with the blonde chick that comes out and talks to you. That chick's hot. She That's saved so my life in hotels a couple of times. <laughs> that little blonde chick. She's like, just like Felicia Michaels. If you close your eyes, you think it's fucking Felicia Michaels. Hilarious. Who? This girl on Showtime, <laughs> and they do a half-hour show, and she does the whole show naked. Oh, Katie Morgan, I think? I think that's her name. Really cute, blonde, squeaky voice. Yeah. And she talks about sucking dick and eating ass, and she plays video, and she'll talk about the history of finger banging. <laughs> and it goes back to <laughs> the, the cave, history man. of finger banging. Yeah. I love that. <clears throat> no, this is, listen, I, shit. <laughs> I didn't think I'd be on the fucking road at this age. Right. I thought I would just be collecting checks from the sitcom I did as the neighbor. Right, right. I had just done the seven-year run on the neighbor down at fucking, uh, <laughs> what's my fate? There's another studio I like. CBS Radford? That, yeah, like I just went to CBS Rap at the <laughs> Studio City. What do you want for lunch, Joe? How about a little sushi dang? Give me the chicken teriyaki white meat and double up on the salad and a few pieces of albacore because that's how they roll over there. Right. But that's what I thought, but no, it didn't turn out that way. So, But sometimes you want to go to China, but you end up in fucking Japan. Right. So it's the same difference. This shit know? is just more powerful. Bro. I love it. Like this This why you this talking why about. This why is a this, bad motherfucker this right This why here. helps me not have to depend on somebody else telling me who I'm going to be, how far there I'm going to go. get. And, and, and there's beauty in this why. It's like control your own destiny in this why. There's no so more I, excuses. There's no more excuses in this why. I don't why. give a fuck whether you live in Metuchen, New Jersey, or fucking Iowa. You want to do something now on this, on this whole thing. You want to show me what you got. It's a, it's a, you know what? If you got an iPhone now, you can go on Periscope and show me what you got. Yeah. It's that simple. And if you're that good, you'll shine through. Yeah. It's that fucking simple. You you could go into training now at the age of nine. You could do a show in your fucking bedroom if you're nine. Look at Cassius Moore. Yeah, I was going to say. In five years, Cassius Moore is going to be fucking uh, uh, Johnny Carson, you know. But it's, it adds a lot of pressure, though. What's the pressure? That now you don't have an excuse. A lot of no, like you don't have excuses. an excuse. Yeah, you don't have an excuse. Yeah, but the, you know, the cream rises to the crop. But whoever was making excuses, then see you later. And then the people that don't care about excuses and they're about going out there and getting it they they'll get it it's, the only thing is sometimes some people have more balls and talent but i can't get mad at somebody with more balls and talent at least they're using their balls that's how i look at it that it's all mixed in some way or another you right. know you say whatever you want to say this kid made ten hundred million dollars what's the you can't touch this can't talk touch about, this what's talk his about name hammer 
Yeah, that motherfucker used to sell albums in front of the comedy store. Yeah, the yeah. people coming oh, out of so the comedy did? store. No way. Chewy will tell you. Those door people tell you the stories. They still remember him. You know, he was a bat boy for fucking the Oakland A's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, th- th- this, sometimes you hear these stories, and this is what it... Uh, Lee, where the fuck were we? We were talking about the desire. Uh, Ian, tell Lee about the desire to be good at stand-up. What goes through your heart? What goes through your soul? When you sign your name and your last on the fucking list and you see a dude up on stage that's killing him at the end of your fucking open mic thing and you're funnier than he is, but you can't tell him what to desire. How many times do you want to go on stage? What do you think about all day? Do you think about anything else when you want to fucking be good at comedy? It's, it's like, it's, it's something like you're in a job where you have to kind of prove yourself every time you get on stage and you have to accept that this is what I do. I got to prove myself. And the desire to, like, this is a funny thing where if you don't do as much as you can, somebody will catch you from behind. And if you don't do as much as you can, you'll never catch the people ahead of you. And so you just always have to stay on your toes and keep working and keep grinding, keep writing and trying to figure out ways how to, to, to gain inches on the person on, in front of you and on, on the person behind you. But you have to love to want to do that. You know, you, you, you got to love to want to accomplish something. Then it's for you. Then, then it's easier. You know what I mean? Like, I always want to be funny. Like, I like hanging around with young comics. <coughs> I think more than, it's like some older comics, they get, like, bitter. Or they just get tired and wear down. Like, young comics ex- inspire me. Like, oh, these people are hungry. And they look up to me. So I don't want them to never not look up to me. Like, the way I'm not looking up to this older guy who's just, like, just mailing it in. So, it, it, I just just want I don't I don't I don't know I think right now because I'm not where I want to be I'm still hungry but I hope when I get to where I want to be that I stay hungry as I am now what I love about where I'm at now is the fact that I'm still hungry uh, like that that itself is a gift that I enjoy I'm hungry in a motherfucker you know yeah always yeah always. that's why I love you His like wheels it, are always fucking turning yeah uh, if I have an idea for somebody, I'll pass on the karma. Hey, man, I was watching you on stage the mm-hmm. I think you should really fucking jump off a building, whatever the fuck <laughs> it is that you do. I love watching you. You know, uh, ever since I went back to the comedy store, mm-hmm. I was trying to explain to my friend Jody today mm-hmm. that your game improves. I've mm-hmm. said it on the podcast many times. Right. You're at the world's best, at least the top three uh places to do stand up comedy. This mm-hmm. is it. This is this is it. You're a fucking you're a Tex you're an army ranger. Right. You're a Navy SEAL. You're you're a fucking you're the best of the best. You know, and I, I, I a couple nights I went there and watched you and I was blown away by oh, your shit, writing. Thanks, man. Blown away from the abortion joke to no commitment. You know, you've got three things going on that you have broken the joke down. Mm-hmm. I would love to aspire to write like somebody like you. It is. Are you, are you kidding me, Joey D? Oh my this? God! And you're smooth. <laughs> you're smooth, which I really like. I like people that come around the back door and make you think, but fuck your world up. You make them think and fuck mm-hmm. their world up. I come at you. Joe Rogan comes at you. It's a no-brainer. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a different type of energy. Mm-hmm. Your energy is very. It's jazz. It's jazz. It's, and you know what? It's Jamaican jazz, <laughs> which doesn't exist. It's you. The smoothness in your voice and how your tones and you stop, that's the gift. Right. That's the gift that people don't know. The, the power of the voice and stand-up mm-hmm. is what don't hit you till about the 12th year. Right. When you realize how powerful your voice is. When I whisper, yo, don't listen to my And then when I get loud, it's too... The, the power right, of the mind. Right. And I know it. I, I don't know how to teach it to you. If you came to me, Lee, and said, dog, I want to be the best stand-up. I was watching the other night and what you do with your voice. Your voice controls the game. That's why they give you the microphone. That's why I fuck up and walk away from the microphone. When you walk away from the microphone, you lose your power. That power is, but your voice and comedy and your thing. Like, when I close my eyes, it's like a... Julia serving. Uh-huh. The rhythm is in the Damn, I'll take that. Yeah, you, you're the you're the the smoothness. 
and I've never heard that type of smoothness. Damn. There's a guy that has that smoothness, mm -hmm. but it's a complete different smoothness, and that's Dave Chappelle. Right, right. It's a complete different smoothness. You took it somewhere else. Right. So it's really, that's what I see, man. Oh, thanks, man. In I my comedy that. world, I like, I like, bro, I'm a student of the game. Right. I want to see what makes you tick, mm -hmm. and I want to see why they're laughing. Right. You know what I'm saying? I want to see why they're laughing. Let's see why they're fucking really laughing. Are they his words? If people knew that your words don't even matter. Right. People, if people knew at home, it's like when people say, I love intelligent comedy and thoughtful. <laughs> I like in comedy that, it, what they say, that incites my brain. Right? Go suck a dick that smells like ass. That'll make you fucking think. <laughs> All right? So you know what I'm saying? That'll well, make you think. Go suck a dick that smells like ass. Yeah, why is this guy's dick smells like ass as you're sucking it? That's his $54,000 question right there. But it's, uh, I love stand-up, man. I've always loved it. And the more I do it, the more respect I have for it. Right. I have a ton of respect for it. I've never run a light. I've never disrespected oh, a comic so. like that. I have a ton of respect for it because it took me out of a dark place. It right. took me out of a gutter. I respect it. I respect it like a fucking lion. I respect that comedy store stage. Mm -hmm. I know what's happened to me. You know, I never went to Juilliard. Right. I ain't no fucking, who's the big black dude? Bing oh, Rames. Bing Rames. I didn't nice. go to Juilliard. That motherfucker went to Juilliard. I didn't yeah. go to Juilliard. I didn't take no acting classes when I was in New York. You know what? Acting was fucking front and drugs. Your life. That's your life. Acting yeah. is when you go up to people and say, dog, lend me 20. I'll bring them back in an hour. I got this check that's coming. <laughs> this dude, I sold them an encyclopedia and they give me the 20. That's acting. Uh, and then you are in a fucking room with, you know, the director from Drugstore Cowboy. Mm -hmm. And John Travolta's in the room, and they, I thought about that today because Battlestar Galactica was. What's that movie Travolta made about the Scientologist? Uh, Bat Bat uh, something Earth. Battle Earth, Earth. Battle Earth. Something like that. I was, bro. Me and Billy Goddell were about to get hired to be Travolta's <laughs> sidekicks in a movie about a singer from Hoboken, New Jersey, that disrespected Sinatra. Mm -hmm. True story. Jimmy Roselli disrespected Frank Sinatra. Didn't sing at his mother. Jimmy Roselli was petrified of Sinatra. Sinatra was petrified of Roselli. Uh -huh. He had a better voice than Sinatra. And his mother would always talk about Jimmy Roselli. You got to be more like Jimmy Roselli. <laughs> so when Sinatra busted out, he hired Jimmy Roselli to sing at his mother's thing, and he never showed up. Oh, so shit. he said, really? I'm cutting you off. He cut him off so bad that Jimmy Roselli used to sell albums from the trunk of his car in Hoboken, New Jersey. Damn. And the Italians would go, Jimmy, close the trunk. You're embarrassing us. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so man. we had that fucking movie. And I'll never forget, dog. I went to the comedy store on a Sunday mm -hmm. and got fucked up. Like, blow and the whole fucking thing, eating somebody's ass, like, till <laughs> 3 in the morning. <laughs> Just a normal Tuesday. And this, and I had a callback for this. Now, I had gone over it. I knew it. But that fucking cocaine and all that party and threw the shit off. And I went in there Monday at 10 o'clock. And I thought it was going to be me and who directed Cocaine Cowboy, you know? Van the Zandt. Documentary? No, no, the, the movie. The movie? With, with Matt Dillon, Van Zant. Badass motherfucker. He did something after that. It wasn't bad. I thought it was just going to be Gus Van Zant. Fuck no, it was Travolta. Oh shit. At ten fifteen. Oh like, shit, after the night you had. After the night I got, Travolta oh, gotta show up in this bitch. <laughs> and I remember I had to go in there first and he was great and I did great and they, they called my agent and they said, oh, You know shit. what, we got a pen in him and two days later my agent goes, You got a spot tonight somewhere they wanna come see you. Gus Van Zant and the casting director. Mm -hmm. I said, Yeah, at the comedy store and they fucking showed up. Gus Van Zant shook my hand. He said, Listen, I'll be seeing you soon. And I'm in Miami doing the improv, feeling good about myself. I'm about to do a Travolta movie. And my fucking manager calls me and goes, Dog, he took Battlefield Galactico <laughs> over fucking some Scientology uh. movie over your movie. It's over. It got written. The script is done. Nothing. They never did it again. I mean, he, he had to take that movie. He had to take Battlefield Earth. Yeah, they showed him pictures <laughs> of him playing with little fucking Asian boys, <laughs> playing soccer with little Asian boys with fucking thongs on. They you know, know all his secrets. They, on, they really recorded them. Did. Yeah, he had to take it. Who would tell somebody? That's how they got. The, but you seen the Scientology documentary? I'll tell you what. This is how they come to you, though. They don't. You don't tell them shit at first. Mm -hmm. They come to you. Once you're sucking some dude's dick, he's going to take out like a little iPhone and go, somebody wants to talk to you on Periscope. <laughs> <laughs> and it's that old dude, Jell Ron Hubbard, going, listen, we got you. We got cameras so all over that room. 
we got a dildo up your ass that's right. going to be fucked up when we show the pictures to welcome back Cotter. <laughs> you, better, you better be up at 444 Los Feliz tomorrow. So bad. Bring an envelope and bring a notebook. <laughs> Remember, he took the courses. Did you see that? They talked yeah, about yeah. He took the courses. He was in. You know, you know what's funny about that documentary? Like, the first two courses in, in Scientology are actually <coughs> legit. Like, if you break it down. It's like any religion. Like, every religion has, like, roots of truth. And then after that, they just make shit up. And to me, when I was watching the, the Scientology, I said, this, this could have actually been a decent honest religion but then they started making up levels so that you can pay more money to get to those levels and it was a point of like pride and esteem for people to get to those levels and then you get to the briefcase level where they just open this briefcase and they tell you this crazy ass story that couldn't be true and you were worse off at that level than you were in level one and level two if you'd have just tapped out right then and there but they just made this shit up for money but the first two things it has to be believable enough to get you in and you're like every time you're going up you're like but the first two levels were legit so the rest of the shit even though it feels hokey it it, it should be all right and the same thing christianity does or just most religions it's like you know the, the first the first few things like this is solid then it gets go you keep going up <laughs> it's that's when shit gets crazy but you believe them because of the first two have you guys ever got tested? I've been here four and a half years, and I just, like, two weeks ago you got, got tested. No, I didn't get tested. Someone asked me on the street if I wanted to. And you kept walking, I hope. Hell yeah. Yeah, I'd never, I'd never do it. It's like Santeria. One minute you're throwing some cards, the next minute you're up in the Bronx naked, <laughs> getting water poured on you by three black dudes playing That's a conga drum and shit. Right <laughs> First two levels of Santa Maria. <laughs> Santa Maria. Santa Maria is good. That's right. We got to do a little fucking... Uh, Tony Bennett, break it up a little bit and shit. We do this every Monday out of respect. All right. I want to be around to pick up the pieces. This is a badass jam, bro. Yeah. I like this dude. I, I like Tony Bennett because he never panicked. You know what I mean? His whole career, he just never panicked. He just got older and older. Yeah, I'm just going to keep doing this. He's getting fucking paid. <laughs> yeah. He's like 100. Do me a favor. Play the beginning of I Left My Heart in San Francisco. Doug, this song, I play this every Monday. Mm-hmm. Uh, mon- Monday morning as I'm getting ready. And sometimes I, I'm doing shit and the next ro- song flows in because it's the greatest hits album. Mm. And it's a, I Left My Heart in San Francisco. You got to hear the first fucking verse of this. Oh, okay. He knocks it out of the park, though. Knocks it out of the park. Too much. Sorry, that was wrong. Sorry. (laughs) Don't touch nothing, cocksucker. (laughs) I'm fine. We're good. I'll bite that fucking finger. (laughs) That's a bad dude, dog. Yeah. He's a gangster. That's a bad motherfucker right there. That guy takes it to the next level for a white dude. <laughs> That's hilarious. He's fucking singing songs of Lady Gaga. Who's uglier? <laughs> you ever see them two standing together? Who the fuck wins that ugly contest? It's <laughs> fucked up. It's hilarious. They both got hooked noses. You know, you you, know, you break out a Coke <laughs> rock around those two vacuums to see what happens. Yeah, it looked like she got on a Tony Bennett costume. <laughs> 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 like, who's who? Oh my God! But I like him, man, because he stuck around. He's like, like he had to weather out Sinatra and just everybody else. Music changing, and he's like, ah, I'm just, I, I'm just gonna keep doing this shit. I'm never he keep did. this tuxedo. And then, and then he kind of won. He went through a lot. He weathered a lot of music genres, 
changes, yeah. bigger stars than him, but this motherfucker kind of won. And then he started singing duets with Bono. And yeah. He just started doing fucking duets with people. It's it's. No, you really got to hand it to him. Yeah. Some people just weather it the fuck out. Yeah. How many times have you been like, ah, this Tony Bennett thing is going to go away? And it's a decade after decade after decade, and you're like, Tony you Bennett's household. You know why? Because he stays out there. Yeah. Even if he ain't singing, you know, he stays out there. Yeah. He's probably out there three weekends a month. Yeah. Probably has it down. One show, mm -hmm. you know, $52 a ticket. He sings for 45 minutes and gets the fuck out of there. Yeah. And he goes back to his hotel room and he goes to sleep and he takes care of himself. He right. probably has a train and he eats well. He's like, you know, those guys, how old is Tony Bennett? Let's see how old that motherfucker right. is. And let's see where he is this weekend. He's like, when Frank Sinatra dies, they're going to need someone to sing old music. And I'm just going to be alive and I'm going to be the dude. And he made it. This motherfucker's, this motherfucker's amazing. All right, so he was born in 26. So Jesus. he's 74 there, 74 and 15 is what? 89. He's about to turn 90. He's about Jesus. to turn. Oh, no, he's about to turn 89 and in when, August. When is he traveling? Where is he this weekend? Let's see. He's fucking always somewhere, dog. I guarantee he's some fucking casino jumping up and down this Four. weekend. Oh, shit. He's in uh, London. Told you. He's in London with Lady Gaga. Oh, shit. And then he's going to Atlantis with Lady Gaga, New York, at Radio City Music Hall. Do they have an album together or some shit? I think they were in Vegas. What, wasn't Token there saying they're in Vegas together? I knew they did a song, but they have an album together? Yeah, yeah. Something. I don't know. They're, he, they're going all over the country. Mon Monte Carlo. Fucking 90. Fucking 90. Belgium, Italy. And he's in London tonight doing a show, The Flight. Somebody said they bumped into him in LAX. Somebody saw him. Mm -hmm. Some friend of mine said, Doug, I saw Tony Benny. It looked like a million bucks. Oh, right. Doug, that's what it is. Those guys, you know who else would have been cleaning up? Not Cosby. Cosby was doing shows with yeah. 100 of tickets. I went to see him. He went to see him. He was cleaning up. And well, how long does he do? He sits the whole time. He did like a while. He did like, I went to like the taping of his special. He, he did like almost, I think, two hours, two and a half hours. How was that special? The one I saw was great. The one they put out sucked. He, he he did two hours. They had to condense it, <coughs> but uh, yeah. I, I, I blew it. I wanted to see him, and some of my friends went to see him, and then I said, I'll, I'll get a chance to see him, and then the scandal dropped. He's still doing then, some gigs though. Yeah, I, I should look it up and go see him before before he got no more shows. <laughs> before somebody gives him one of those Cosby pills and shit. <laughs> yeah, before yeah, it's, it's hilarious. That's what they should change it to. Oh, the Cosby pill. Oh my god. I've gotten women fucked up, but I've never <laughs> given them a Cosby pill. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, I don't have the Cosby balls to pill. do that. Because they're going to know when they wake up in the morning. Right, right. And you're going to fuck them, and they're going to feel their pussies fucked up. You know, what are you going to mm -hmm. do? Just, what happened? I don't know. <laughs> my pussy hurts. I got a fucked up thing in my eye. You know, what happened last <laughs> night? Because I used to do creepy shit. I'm coming to hand when they're sleeping and shit. I'll do creepy shit, dog. Once I yes. bang them, and then like my dick would get hard, like an hour later they'd be passed out. Right. I go back in that room and like open up their legs and look at that little monkey again and try to bang one out and shit. I'm fucking fucked up. Like, you know. I'd love it to be like on CNN, like <laughs> another Joey Diaz accuser. <laughs> There's no Joey Diaz accusers. I'm just saying that fucking it's true. It's we get all, but I could never give somebody. I remember when the roofies were big. Right. I used to hang out with a girl that liked taking them. Like, oh, for real? We'd split one. We'd split one. In Boulder. Damn. That's fucking crazy. But I've never put in some chick's drink. I'd be fucking embarrassed. That's not my game. I would never poison somebody like that. I, I don't mind poisoning Lee, giving him edibles, <laughs> and lying to him and shit. No, we all know you don't mind doing that. Nah. <laughs> I don't think Lee would mind it either. <laughs> I could take a break. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't be that bad. It's, uh, I don't know, man. I just, uh, I, and I known you for a while, but I, I didn't mm -hmm. go to the store, so I didn't see you as much. Right? Yeah, you you you, you stopped coming through, then I, I didn't see you, and then but you know after the changes, you know the Tommy out thing, and you and Rogan came back, and, and it just breathed like fresh air into the store, man. It's a great place. It's man. a great place now. Like some of that darkness that it had more darkness, because but you need some of the darkness to create the atmosphere that the store is, but some of it is lifted, so it has the right mix of like light and darkness. 
But you, the store does need some type of da- darkness. The right? darkness is what pulls the comedy out of you. Right. If you let the store get into you like that, late night sets, and you go down there four nights a week, and mm-hmm. you, let me tell you something, it'll pull some shit out of you that you don't know is in there. Right. Because this is the way I used it. I had to follow Mooney. So by the time I got up, they Damn. had heard everything. They had heard everything, G. So mm-hmm. now you got to talk to them about what the fuck was going on. And in that, there's pearls of wisdom. Right. They're tough to get to, mm-hmm. but it's a different angle. I love being under pressure with 200 eyeballs on me. Damn. That's my world. Mm-hmm. That's when I can really kick it in, especially if I smoke a little bit and I'm just kicking back in that stance. It's going to be a fucking long night for you. And, but mm-hmm. the store taught me that. Right. The darkness of the store. Listen, it don't. Th- a fucking just no regular people become comedians. Right. No regular people become from comedians. If you come from a normal fucking childhood, you don't become a comedian. Somewhere along the line, something stung you, and you're trying to work it out. You don't even know it's stinging. You. Right. That's the weird thing about comedy. You don't even know, you know. And uh, there you are. For me, I don't know what the fuck it was. You said you made up your mind. You didn't want a fucking day job. I'll right. tell you what, neither did I. Right. And this was, and I'm telling you honest, this was the path of least resistance at that time right 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 when i was 31 years old this Mm -hmm. was it i had nothing i had nothing at that time i got divorced i blew all my credit cards you know there was no more nobody would front me no more pills (laughs) there was no coke dealers left (laughs) i couldn't rob nobody they blame it on me you robbed everybody no one left to rob there was no drug dealers left to (laughs) rob in boulder and i had to do something and i knew that if i stuck to something because the plan was ian if this didn't work out Mm-hmm. To the next level. I was just going to get a kilo of coke and two guns and Damn. let's play it out to the end of time. To see what happens. Plays of glory. Whether, gun, whether the fucking blow kills me or somebody shoots me, let's see what happens. And I'm really fucking happy that the comedy saved me, you know. Mm-hmm. So when I got into it, I put a heavy commitment into this. It's right. like you. You've been doing it 23, 24 years right. like me. 24 years. Mm-hmm. At the eight-year mark, you're in. Right. You ever see people in L.A. when you got here and all of a sudden you forget about those motherfuckers? And you see them on Facebook, and you see what the fuck they're doing now. Yeah. And you sit there, like, and you go, I went to an acting class with this motherfucker, Rob. I went to a meeting. This guy was up for a show with me. He quit. It feels like you're looking at somebody's funeral. They're alive, but they're not doing what you met them doing, and you feel sad that they didn't continue. And it's almost like, like, I remember, <laughs> this is another huge story. I was like, hey, man, Teddy's moving back to New York. And he's like, Teddy's moving back to New York? And he said it like Teddy died. I said, no, he's still alive. But you're right. That nigga's moving back to New York. He's dead. <laughs> and, that, and that's how I look at it when I, the, in that vein that you just mentioned. I look at it that that commitment you told me you were in mm-hmm. was all fake. You were confused. You came to LA. Right, right. You went to Montreal. You got the deal. You were at the store, you were at the improv, you got a manager, and then one day out of the fucking clear blue sky, I don't see you no more. Right. I don't know what happened. And then three years later, Facebook comes along with Twitter, and there you are on Facebook talking to Lee. And I look, and I look at your page, and I see a kid or whatever, and I mm-hmm. see that you're at a bowling league now. I'm not mad at you, at by no means. I don't even think you're dead. I don't even look at it that way. For right. you to get, and I know they all miss it. Like Mike Recker misses it. Right. You and know, Mike all, left. All Mike. his homies miss it. Yeah. But I don't understand how you came out here and had this commitment. We did all these things. You were at the Laugh Factory with me. We did all these things. And one day you just stopped. Mm-hmm. I never understood that. Yeah. I never understood that. I can't get that. And I hope I never get that. You know, like, I, I never want to understand it. I just want to keep pushing forward and just keep this energy that I got to just keep going forward. Well, no. I, you, listen, you're a special fucking gem. You're already there. Mm-hmm. It's just, uh, you know that jar right. that nobody could open? Mm-hmm. And then your mother comes along with, with a missing finger ah. and opens that <laughs> motherfucker? That's all that's right at the point where you're at right now. You and I both know this. Mm-hmm. You're talented. It's your time. You just right. need a little pushover. Uh, you can never... Listen, man, this is going to taste better for you. you. You didn't come here. You wanted a flat. How many flash in the pants you know out here? A lot. How many? How many a lot. people got a big deal in Montreal and they started cutting motherfuckers at the store, <laughs> bumping bitches at the store? 
and now you see them and they can't even make look at you. Look at look at that thing I read five weeks ago about Vinny Favorito. Weren't we at the store, Vinny Favorito? Weren't you at the store? With I know me? that name. Who the fuck is the that? The dude who robbed everybody in Vegas. He took loans. Italian dude. He's a comic, he right? Came, th that dude came out here with a blaze of glory. Right. I mean, he shot every motherfucker. He went to the store, bam. Went to James Masada, bang. Mm -hmm. Went to the improv. Not only did the improv put him up, but fucking what's his name? Started taking him on tour with him. The old man. Who that? You know, fucking Bud Friedman. Started oh, putting him everywhere. All oh, the kid was, uh, went to Montreal. Didn't get a deal, but came back. Somebody gave him a TV show. He took the magician in with him. And all of a sudden, shit started spilling out from everywhere. That this guy had fucking done an open mic class in Boston, took everybody's money and left. Oh, shit. He was one of those type of gangsters. <laughs> then he disappeared from here. Then people are like, no, he's in Vegas. He's doing fucking great. And I'm sitting there going, this dude had a really bad gambling problem. Right, right. And now he goes to Vegas. Weird. And it just disappeared. And I'm not the type of guy that's going to put him down. Mm -hmm. You just give like that a guy like that rope. Right. Because it's like me going to Miami in 95. I would have been dead right now. <laughs> right, right. You don't send Joey Diaz to Miami for no reasons at all in those days. <laughs> the Coke up here is 60. Down there it's $25. <laughs> you know how many of those I can eat a fucking day? Yeah. You know, it's like they sent Hollywood Henderson to Miami. You're too young for Hollywood Henderson, right? Oh, you remember Hollywood <laughs> nah, Henderson? No, I don't remember. Hollywood Henderson was a fucking bad-ass Dallas cowboy. Uh -huh. Bad-ass from the sticks of Texas. When I'm type of black motherfuckers, <laughs> I'll give you the article and I'll put it in my car. Right, this dude, Sergio Ortega, gave it to me. And he describes his first day at Thousand Oaks at the training facility right here in California. Mm -hmm. The Dallas Cowboys do that oh, thing yeah, up there. Yeah. He's like, here I am, a 20-year-old rookie, and all I got is $15, three hits of acid, a gram of blow, and a couple of joints. And I'm in a dormitory with a bunch of fucking Momo. Something like you're like, <gasps> and from there on, dog, he talks about going to the comedy store and picking up prior and the Pointer Sisters and fucking oh, cooking shit. up fucking met, uh, crack before, mm -hmm. you know, free base is what they called it. Right. At 20? He was, t dog, this guy was ripping it up. He's ahead NFL. of his time. He was ahead of his time. Nobody remembers it no more. Let me tell you mm -hmm. an interesting story. He fucking. Uh, started intercepting motherfuckers, like getting interceptions and scoring. Mm -hmm. And then they went to the Super Bowl. And he took a can of Orange Crush. That's what they called the Denver defense. Mm -hmm. And he crushed it on national TV. And then the Super Bowl, he caught an interception and ran <laughs> into the Super Bowl. And this motherfucker was King Dick. And if you read like that whole Playboy thing, he talks about having an apartment up here and having three white bitches <laughs> and having an apartment in Dallas. <clears throat> and that for his 27th birthday, Ed Tutor Jones gave him four bitches, a redhead, an Asian, four a black bitches. chick, and a <laughs> fucking a, a Martian. And he fucked all four of them. I mean, this guy, I mean, you're sitting there going, holy fuck. <laughs> and they starts talking about fucking carrying pistols and being up here. And he just went AWOL. So after he wins the Super Bowl, they all know he's crazy. And if they show old footage of Dallas... It's really interesting to see him because in the locker room, after they won that Super Bowl, mm -hmm. you could see him in the back with no shirt on going, party. <laughs> like, he was just out there. Though. Right. He was 20 years ahead of his time. And then in the game on CBS, he fucking, they were losing. Mm -hmm. And the camera went to him, and he went like this. We're number one, motherfucker, something. Mm -hmm. Next day, Tom Landry cut his ass. Oh, right. And where did they send him? Miami. And oh, shit. shit. And he just went AWOL and got <laughs> guns. But he got locked up. Went to jail, came out, became a born again Christian. And about six years ago, he won a million dollars in the Texas lottery. Oh, for real? So, yeah, Jesus, he's born lucky. There you go and shit. Was he on the team that won 16 0? The Dallas? No, that's no, Miami no, no, Dolphins. That's, that's what I meant. Because you said he went to Miami. He went to, no, no, no. He went to Miami like in 77 and there was, oh, done. Okay. There was way after that. No, this happened like in 75, 76. You got to get your shit together. You're a lot younger. You're, you're a young man. You don't remember these things and shit. I don't. You know, you know why? You know, it, 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 might, it might not even be an age thing. Like, I was in Jamaica probably when that shit was happening. So I came. No CBS here. Sports in Jamaica. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So for some reason they didn't have American football in Jamaica. So, you know. Now how many years were you in Jamaica? Nine to? To 17. Went to high school down there? Yeah, I went to high school down and there. And you were smoking ganja and all that shit? Yeah, we, that we did it. Like, we, we, we had, like, a, like a, a soccer field in my neighborhood. And then there's a. 
play with like the older dudes and then there was in Jamaica when people start building a house it could take 20 years to finish building the house so then there's this house across the field across the street from the soccer field that it wasn't abandoned it's just that they had the whole frame up all the blocks but it had no windows some of it didn't have no roof like somebody was like building it slowly sending money down and like building it brick by brick so it was like kind of like a a clubhouse with no floor and we just hang out over there i remember one day it was raining and i went to the soccer field see if they was playing and look at the house and there's smoke coming from out the house and walk over there all the older soccer dudes were there and he's passing joints around smoke with them and shit and do stuff like that let me ask you something you know that what's the religion bob marley did uh rastafarian and they who's their god they Raj. believe like Haley Selassie was the second coming of Christ. But when he sings that song, Exodus, mm-hmm. who's he saying in the beginning? They believe in the Bible, but they believe that Haley Selassie is, is the second coming of Christ. So, so, so they, they believe in the Old Testament, and so, so they, they, they're kind of Christian. I don't want to, like, say... But, but there, there's a lot of shit from the Bible that they believe. And then they also believe about, you know, that that corporate people and a lot white people did a lot of fucked up shit. And it was about, and they believe in Hellas last because there was a picture of him and his foot. Ethiopia was at war with Italy and they beat Italy. And uh, there's a picture of him, Hellas last with his foot on this bomb that didn't explode like a missile or some shit and it just was like oh shit this motherfucker's god you know and he just became basically the rastafarian's god the rastafarian's jesus christ and i think i'm accurate but you know you could check it but and you know it was about just being healthy and being spiritual and living good and not hurting people and, and smoking dope and smoking you know that's just it. to get in contact con- you know, spirit, you know spiritual the spiritual thing get in contact with your higher consciousness and not fucking people over and growing your hair like Mama Tribe style, you know? No shit. And being fearless, yeah. So you're 17, you end up in New York City. Mm-hmm. Who's up there? Uh, my mother's there, and we all came up, me, my father, my two sisters, and my brother. And I uh, finished high school in uh, right. Uniondale High School in Long Island. Went there. and uh, By the Coliseum. Near the Coliseum, yeah. And I was just like, there's a bunch of Jamaicans there hung out with them because I identified with them, and uh, but they was making fun of the, the Yankee kids, uh, like dominated the school. Yankees like any American black kid, we we call them Yankees. They call us Yardies, and we fight every day. And if a Jamaican person got into a fight, you was in a fight. And I was like, why are y'all starting these fights? These niggas outnumber us. We in America, like why, <laughs> like. Are we bad at math? Like, we're not going to win this fight after school. There's 10 Yardies, 200 Yankees. Stop starting these fights. <laughs> but you got to go fight or else then you got no friends. It's, it's like being in jail. It's like if you don't fight with your people, then you ain't got no people. So you either don't fight. Or switch. Or, or, or switch. I can't switch. switch. My accent was thick. <laughs> They they like, like nigga, you was Jamaican yesterday. <laughs> There's no way you ain't Jamaican now. We can hear it. <laughs> so it's just like fuck it. But you know, we had fun, and you know, we we we, we just just got along and just started knowing people and spreading. Had a little job at Burger King, making some. First, I started cutting lawns. Had my own business, and then got a little job at Burger King and worked there for a long time. Stayed there too long, and uh like through college and shit and I had security guard jobs and shit like that and there's one day when I was at Burger King uh, some dude was on the drive through like so then I had a problem not a problem but learning how to communicate with people like the way I'm talking to you now like I had to learn this like I'd been in like when I was a kid in England that was my comfort zone I was from zero to nine all I knew was English you know what I'm saying like 
hanging around English people, and a lot of those English people were my cousins. They were Jamaican, and just but you just it was a mixed society, and you know how to communicate and talk with them. Like they only had whatever radio stations they had, everybody listened to it. You know, whatever sports they were, everybody followed it. So then you it was easy to communicate with people. Then when you moved to Jamaica, or when we moved to Jamaica, I knew a lot about Jamaica because in England our parents taught us that. So I and. England used to be a colony of England, so we had a lot of things in common. So then when I was in Jamaica, I could easily relate. Plus, I was interesting because I'm a nigga from England in Jamaica, so people want to talk to you. You know what I'm saying? But then when you're Jamaican and you come to America and you're like, you, this, it's kind of intimidating because it's all the shit you've seen on TV, and now you're here in this big ass pot. And it's like, like in Jamaica, you could feel the side of the pool. In America, there is no side of the pool. You're just in the middle of it. And you're like, you got to navigate your way around this shit. So that's when I started watching, started rooting for the Giants. Like I learned that people talk sports and music and uh, sports music. And there was a guy there. His name was Greg Ellis. He was funny as shit. He was a singer. And he was funny as shit. And everybody loved hanging around Greg and working on his ship at Burger King. Like, this thing would just have you laughing, clowning people. And I enjoyed hanging out with him. And I was like, oh, that's what you do. You just get funny. You tap into your funny side. And, you know, I was so just socially lost. I forgot that, you know, something that I was doing naturally in Jamaica. You know, when you're trying to find your center in a new place, you, you forget until it hits you. It's like, oh... The shit you was doing in Jamaica, nigga. Just being a person and being funny and have some some uh, context on how to be funny. Like, no sports, no music. Because you feel behind. Like, the things that everybody knows out here, you don't know. You know, so you feel behind. So you're doing a lot of catching up. And you're pretending to know shit you don't know, too. You know, just so you can, like... Fit in. Fit in. Yeah. You know no, what I'm no, saying? No, no, it's, it's a... So it's all that shit going on. Oh, my God, you just took me back. Because for me, it Mm -hmm. wasn't as much as the English. It was, I mean, since day one. Like, I I remember waking up and uh, if you asked me when did this all start, it started on 127th Street. Mm -hmm. And there, uh, I learned how to, I didn't know black and white. I just knew friends. Mm-hmm. Where I lived on 88th Street, those kids didn't talk to me because I only my mom would talk to me in Spanish. Right. So they wouldn't talk to me. I don't know why. But after hanging out with Jasper and that whole scene, when I went back to 88th Street, mm-hmm. and once I got to that school, I was always very timid and quiet. I felt socially unacceptable. Right. I was Cuban. I wasn't as good as the white kids. Right. You know, you don't know how to fit in. You, you're trying to find it. And then who saved me was my mom. In a kindergarten on my birthday, that bitch brought a Carvel <laughs> cake and a case of Coca-Cola and cans. The motherfuckers loved me after that. They knew I didn't fuck around. Hello. And I got myself a little piece-ass, little Chinese girl after that. And I started going to her house. I ain't fucking with you. Her That's father hilarious. used to draw for Charles Schultz. Oh, So shit. we'd get the first screenings of fucking any peanut movies. Damn. She'd take me and we'd eat Chinese gum with the wrapper. Chinese, Chinese gum. candy with the wrapper. And we'd <laughs> watch it. And I'd go to her house. And then something happened. And at that time, I was a decent kid. I was very quiet. I was very timid. Mm -hmm. The Green Hornet came along. And I'm watching this Chinese motherfucker bitch slap people, right? And I'm like, I like this, but I can never do this. Mm -hmm. This is not my world. I I could never see myself lifting up my hand to another child. My mom was an antagonizer. Mm -hmm. My mom always wanted me to protect myself. Right. And I go, Mom, I don't want to hit him. My mom would take me home and go, next time that kid push, you got to punch him in the fucking face. And my mom would have hand signals, and sometimes <laughs> I'd do it, sometimes I wouldn't when I was in the park. But I got hit in the head with a flashlight oh, at Central Park. Somebody hit me, took my, uh, not a flashlight, a lunchbox, right. the container, and they hit me. And that changed my game because I didn't like that feeling of getting beaten the fuck up. Now right. I get it why my mom's saying you got to slip and bit slap a motherfucker. But it was too late. I got the stitches. <laughs> so after that, my hook was being crazy. So if you jumped off the third floor, I jumped off the fifth floor. Right. If you fought two guys, I fought three guys. If you hit them with one egg, I hit them with three eggs. Right. I was one of those motherfuckers. <laughs> and then I went up to 148th Street. And that's the melting pot. 
Mm -hmm. I was black, Puerto Rican, Irish, a couple Jews, a couple Germans. Everybody got along. It's like do the right thing. Mm -hmm. Do the right thing is a beautiful movie mm -hmm. because it's about people just talking out loud. But deep down inside, we all get along with one another. We have to communicate with one another every fucking day. I got to go to your Korean store. Mm -hmm. You got to walk by me to get fucking shoes. You know, there's interaction. No, there's right. interaction that you don't know about. Even though I'm sitting on the corner going to those fucking Puerto Ricans, those fucking niggas. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, I'm at the corner with him, hugging him, giving him a dollar so he can get a bottle. Right. Because that's how I roll. But you follow me? If they get along. You just get along. And that's where I got that little melting pot is where... I just got hit. Like, I knew that you had to back your friends. Right. You know, if you want to be fucking whatever, if somebody's fucking with Lee and I'm there and there's eight motherfuckers, you want people to not fuck with you, jump in for Lee and bit slap. And that's it. Right. You're the leader of this crew now. You're giving orders. You're hanging out with the other leaders and shit. So that's the way I knew. I never knew it was about being funny. Right. I never had an idea. That came in later on at right. 13, the odd couple. But, but being, be, like, jumping from the fourth window... When somebody jumps from the third, that shit is funny. Like, you're doing a lot of funny shit, but you don't know how much you're entertaining people. You know, you, you, you're entertaining people more than scaring the shit out of them. You know what I'm saying? Like, this, this, like, <coughs> you're the, you know, you're the crazy, funny motherfucker. You know, but you are identifying with the crazy part, but people are like, this motherfucker is entertaining. I like to hang around this motherfucker. He's amazing. Do you remember the 45 singles? Yeah, the records? Yeah, the yeah. The records, yeah. okay. My mom had a jukebox at the bar. Uh -huh. So when the 45 singles were done, she'd keep them in a box. Mm -hmm. When I went to her record shop, I'd take the 45 singles mm -hmm. and put them in a bag and take them home. She'd go, what are you going to do? I'm going to listen to them. I'm going to uh -huh. listen to them. i go to my back window, and there'd be people out there walking. Oh, shit. And there was a parking garage back there, <laughs> and i whipped those things out of there and hit motherfuckers in the head. That's hilarious. And for months, nobody knew who it was. <laughs> I would go out there and the kids would be saying, yeah, man, somebody's <laughs> whipping fucking records at motherfuckers out there. He cut this guy, he hit this guy in the head, he hit this guy's dog. And finally, <laughs> one day I told like these three little gangsters, I go, if I tell you a secret, mm -hmm. you won't say that. I'm like, I'm the motherfucker <laughs> that's been launching those 45s out the window. And they're like, come on. If, no. And I go, come upstairs. I had boxes of them. Oh, shit. These motherfuckers went nuts. I gave them like a ham and cheese sandwich. <laughs> I let them up there throwing those things out the window for like an hour. Oh, my God. You That's, were a terror. Oh, that shit is crazy, but it's fun. You know what I'm saying? Like throwing records and eating ham and cheese sandwiches. Oh, my God. These for an hour? Oh, these little Puerto Rican where, kids. Where, where are you going to find fun like that? No, that was my whole thing. I was always... I wasn't one of these okay. I wasn't a bad kid. Mm -hmm. I just loved to rock. Right. Like at that age, even at that age with the with the broken English, uh -huh. I was a professional. In New York City, they had trees, uh -huh. but in the in the spring, they would come with these fucking dirt balls. Mm -hmm. They were these little fertilizer, fucking Arab balls. That's how they built the World Trade Center with these little things, and they were like man-made <laughs> dirt, and they put it around the tree. Mm -hmm. And then it would, after it rained, it would sink in and break in. Right. Those things, when they hit you, they oh, would hit you. They hurt a little bit, but they blow up. So you'd have dust all over you and <laughs> shit, right? Dog, I would launch those little fucking things. <laughs> 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 I hit a motherfucking Puerto Rico with an ice cube. You should have been a pitcher. Oh, my <laughs> God. From the eighth floor at the hotel. I took a you would snipe people? Oh, like, dog, from the eighth uh, floor in a Puerto Rican hotel with my family, I went upstairs. I started throwing ice cubes off the roof, and some dude was walking, and that ice root cube caught momentum, and I <laughs> knocked momentum. that motherfucker out. <laughs> and they were looking to see who was doing it, and they knocked on my door, and they knew from the look on my face I was guilty as hell. I didn't have to say nothing. That's hilarious. You said something to me the other day. You said, it, like, you're going to be, like, Hummer's going to come back at you with mercy? Like, oh, I know all for this a fact. Stuff. My daughter, I know for a fact. I was from four to seven, man. I was brutal after my dad died. Mm -hmm. You know, when you lose your dad, you got no control. My, my mom didn't know what to do. My mom was crazy, so she gave it back to me. Right. I would have overpowered a regular woman right, right. at that age. It was just a, it was a horror show what I did to my mom. And I wasn't a bad kid. I just missed my dad. Right. Once she remarried, that calmed me down. Mm -hmm. And then Did you accept that dude right away? Yes, I did. It was the weirdest thing because I, I yearned for a man. And right. I, you know, I was always around women and shit. Mm -hmm. I liked it, but ah, after a while, I'm smelling perfume and people kissing me. I got lipstick on. They call me my fucking hair. I want to learn how to sling dick, Jack. <laughs> 
So now you're in Jamaica and uh, whatever. What, you, what's mean, the f- you mentioned something about the the 45 records, like yeah. in Jamaica. So my f- we used to live in this place called Church Plant Pen, and there's this town called Old Harbor. It's like a one mile walk. And my father worked at the end of Old Harbor at this soybean factory, like he was an engineer over there. And at night, my my sisters used to cook, and then one of us had to take him the food for dinner, and. Uh, so it was my turn, and, and we, we give us bus fare. But if you walk the mile and you walk the, the mile back, you, you get to the keep bus, the bus fare. Sure. And then there was this record that was hot on the radio at the time, this regular record and shit. So I said, I'm going to walk there and back, buy the record, and walk back. And then we get home. My father's going to be at work. Me and my brothers is going to just play this shit all night. So then I get to Old Harbor, walk, give him the food, say goodbye. Stop at the radio, the 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 record stop. Get the get the get the forty five. I'm running home, not paying attention. All I'm thinking about this, and somebody had dug up the fire hydrant that was on the sidewalk, and they left the hole that was filled with water. Oh no! And I fell like a kid fell <laughs> in in the middle of the night, and we don't have street <laughs> lights. So I'm like, one minute I'm running, and the next minute I'm like. You're like the Ray f- Charles' little brother <laughs> in that type of shit. Yeah, I'm like, I'm like <laughs> drowning with a record, trying to, trying to, trying to, trying to hold it above the hole so it, so it doesn't. And I had to climb out that fucking muddy hole, and then and then make it the rest of the way home. And they're like, "What the fuck happened to you?" I don't know. I don't know. Just put this record on, and we just played that shit all night. It's just shit like that. It's a crazy fucking world, man. Yeah, Jamaica. What club did you go up first time? Uh, first time was uh, I worked in East Meadow at Bird King, so the f- club, the, the guy said Hold that on, thing. Chuckles. No, nah, it was uh, it, Chuckles. I did Chuckles too. Like I used to do Chuckles, and but Governors was the first one, so I used to go back and forth between East Meadow, and not East Meadow. East Meadow is where Governors at, and Chuckles in is it Mineola or some shit? Yeah, Mineola. Yeah, I think Mineola. Yeah, so I used to do that. Grandpas in Staten Island. Did I? I never really fucked with Staten Island like that. I would go to Yonkers though. <laughs> what was in Yonkers? Uh, shooting stars or some shit like that was Black there. Black club, white club. White club, white club. They'd have mics. You know, nights where, you know, it wasn't the weekend, but you know, like maybe five or ten people would show up in the audience, and we just give them all our bad comedy. Just beat, beat them, beat the. Try to get all the bad shit out of us. You know, try to do good. Some of us would. Some night you'd be very inconsistent. It was frustrating, and some nights, most nights, first like three, four years of comedy, they wouldn't even be crowd. Sometimes, sometimes like you wouldn't oh, go on for it's weeks. New yeah. York. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah you yeah. get to a spot and it's like no show tonight. You wait around, no show. So you just go eat and talk shit. Who was around back then? What year was this when you're getting on stage for the first couple of times? I'm trying to remember who was around. I know I, I used to go to the comic comic strip to try to pull the, the, the lotto, numbers, right, the, the numbers. numbers and I know Sant, so when I, I'd always get a number because you know the guy that used to give the numbers out and he, I don't he, remember him. it was a guy, he got killed like Mondays, years. right? Like, Mondays or something? You, like went to, you went there, on, you, you get on on a Monday but you went there the first Friday of every month they would do the lotto. You imagine that way? Right, so, you, so if you're a young kid or whatever and you want to get a spot on that stage for that month. You had to. There's a long line of like bad comics, including me, and you go up to the podium, and they have pieces of paper turned over. Some of them had numbers, some of them didn't. If you got a piece of paper with a number, then they'd give you a spot on one Monday for that month. And I'd go, I'd wait online, and it was a big thing to me. Like the first time sure. I went there, like I wanted to get a number. How many? I was like, how many did they have? How many like numbers did they have? Not maybe maybe like I don't know. I can't I, I never never thought about it. Maybe 13 numbers. Wow. For the whole month, you know? And uh, and you you drive to Manhattan is a big thing and you want to get on and then you're online, you're moving up, you're moving up, then it's your turn. And the first time I picked up a piece of paper, it had no number and I fuck, I just came all the way here for nothing. I'm not going to get on. And then I just went back on the back of the line. I was like, I got to try again. And then you get there. Now there's only like three pieces of paper left. 
and it was you didn't get a number when there was more paper why, why the fuck would you get a number now so then I'm looking at the papers people are behind me like nigga hurry up and pick a hurry up and not pick a number so we can not pick a number and then I'm like looking at the thing there was a piece of nu- there was a piece of paper in the corner and it's just so funny how much how big of a decision this was picking up one of these pieces of paper because you just needed to get on and I went for right here like right at the corner of the podium and there was a number on it and I got a spot and then every time I went to the comic strip to pick a number on the first Friday every month I would always pick it from that corner and there was always a number and I would get a spot and then I'd see Adam Sadler Chris Rock come through or just just you know, just just people you've seen on TV had names, and you, you, I'd stay, I'd do my spot. They tell me, no, nah, we're not gonna make you a regular, but I'd stay in that fishbowl section and just watch like people you've seen on TV. And you're a kid, and you're like having the time of your life, trying to make it. Like, you, you at least you can see some end results, and and you have friends that you went to high school with, but they're not doing this what you're doing they didn't see adam sadler that night they didn't see chris rock they didn't see seinfeld or whoever came in they're not living the life you live and you start separating from them because you actually feel special even though you're broker than them you know what i mean you're like like your life is never going to be filled with laughter like mine i can't really fuck with you like that and then i remember one friday i went to pick numbers and i was insecure because I picked like five numbers in a row from this corner spot and I was like there's nowhere it's gonna be here again and I and I said let me I panicked and I grabbed something from the middle there was no number and I was like fuck I should have picked from the from the corner I got back on the line and I was like praying please don't let nobody pick a piece of paper from that corner and I went back and I there was a piece of paper in the corner and I picked it there was a number on it and then from then on I never didn't pick from, from the corner. corner. Fuck and no. I always got on. I always got on. They never passed it, but I always got on. I never had the patience to wait on a line like mm-hmm. that. Like I knew, a, like that laugh factory shit he puts you through when you first move. Oh here. yeah, yeah. I did that one time and I felt so fucking degrading. Like I was like, if I gotta do that, I ain't doing it. Right. I just won't work that fucking club. That line's a different line. That line's a crazy line. Like. From my memory, the line at the comic, stri- comic comic strip in New York, those were comics. Those are comics. You're absolutely correct. The, the, the Laugh Factory, the Laugh Factory, Factory line, people got on costumes. <coughs> people people are homeless. People are like, I like got nothing to do with comedy or should have nothing to do with comedy or on that line. Except the people who go to the comedy store on Monday nights. Right. 7 to 10. There. Half of them have mental illness. Yeah. Don't take a fucking genius to know that. You're right. sitting there going, Joey, you're fucked up too. Yeah, but mm-hmm. these people are really <laughs> fucked really up. Really fucked up. Boom Chakalaka shows up with a fucking uh, uh, a thing, a shopping cart. You yeah. Know? Jeff Richards puts them in videos. I right. mean, that crazy bastard. That boy. <laughs> Boom Chakalaka. The other guy who comes late night and he's a Nazi and he goes in the bathroom, they let him on fire. Michael Epivaya, whatever his fucking name is. I don't, know if, I don't even know I don't if remember. he still comes to the store. Yeah, I don't think so. I got a call one day, Joey, why'd you light <laughs> Epivire on fire last night in the bathroom? That wasn't me. That was Don Barris. <laughs> I guess he hated Jews. Or he was German. Oh, he I know was, that guy. And the he German, come, and he yeah. he would come in at night and you go like this to him. He hated he's Jews. weird as shit. Yeah, he's weird as I shit. I know that guy. So they would wait for him to go to the bathroom and mm-hmm. lock him in there from outside. And then they would throw fire. In the fucking thing from Jesus, <laughs> <laughs> it's like it's in a prison cell. And you, you just set him on fire and shit. <laughs> Try to frag him. I never tried to light him on fire. <laughs> I was out there laughing. Don't Let get him. me wrong. Yeah, you know, Don Barris and a bunch of other guys are trying to light him on fucking fire and stuff. Is that frustrating though? Like, your career isn't based on like how good you are. It's if you pick the number. Like for the first, that must be really frustrating. You do what you can in the beginning until yeah. you start to figure it out. There was a, a, an open mic in San Francisco at the Punchline on Sunday nights, and people would go up there, and they would put you on a list, but there was no names. There was no numbers. Mm-hmm. The guy would come up to you five minutes before and go, you're next, and mm-hmm. he would walk past you and glare at you. I did it one time. 
I told the guy to go fuck himself. And I saw him <laughs> at the fucking laugh factory. Uh-huh. And I go, remember me, bitch? And he was like, fuck you. Oh, fuck you, motherfucker. That <laughs> night you tried to fuck with us. It's hilarious. Fuck you, motherfucker, doing that to a comedian. You know, people don't do that. That's the respect factor I didn't like about the beginning of comedy. Right. And then here, you get it even worse until you book something. Right. See, that's what I always tell young comics when they come out. I try to book something. Mm-hmm. I don't care. Well, I don't care if you gotta suck ten dicks. Just get it out of the way now. <laughs> get it. Book out. something. <laughs> book something so that people see you, the, the the booking agents, and they give you a little work at the improvs. Even them saying, you know, right. they give you a little love. But it's all based on that. They don't give a fuck how funny you are. Oh, this guy's gonna be fun. You know what? If this guy booked the fucking part on uh, what's the show with Vergara, American Family, even if it's a plumber, and people say you booked a role on there, guess what? He might book a role on a pilot that's fucking Seinfeld. And here we're going to turn him down. No, that's not going to happen. It's like when you go to jail and you write letters of recommendation. A, if you get a judge that has political aspirations, that guy, every letter to him is 250 people. Because when you die, they make 250 mass cards. Everybody knows at least 250 people. Dentists, lawyers, communists. Mm-hmm. So every time you send a... If, if I send a letter in in Lee's behalf because you're a swindler, you're really mm-hmm. Bernie Madoff. I gave him a hundred bucks last week. He lost it all in Vegas. <laughs> I invested in this motherfucker. He walked he was away. For he was no a reason. stock fraud. He told me he, he was a poker player. I said, "Well, let me let me stake this guy for twenty points." You know what I'm saying nothing. He came back with rabbit ears. Walked away. There he is. Don't walk away. How long were you in New York for running and gunning before somebody took notice of you? Uh, I was there till like like I said like ninety nine. I just like so the first thing was Keenan Ivory Wayne. The first, the first like I done like some like they had an Uptown Comedy Club TV show, and I did like stand there. That was one hundred twenty fifth Street. Yeah, on the other side. Right, yeah. right, I remember that. So I, I almost walked over there. And I was like, I don't think so. That place used to scare me too. Like I used to yeah. go there. I used to cop Sunday right night. down on that Broadway. Oh, it was a health food store, Mr. Wendell. Oh, I think I remember that. That was when that jam was out, Mr. Wendell. Mm. He was an old dude. That's hilarious. He would always give me chocolate tie weed, and I always try to shoplift one from his hand like a magician. I thought, that, 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 you got to bring that paper back, son. <laughs> yeah, there's only a 20 in here. It's hilarious. All right, so you did Uptown Comedy Club. You come out here. Mm-hmm. Then you did, like, Bad Boys of Comedy. Yeah, I did Bad Boys. And I did Def Jam back in New York, too. How was Def Jam? Def Jam was, it was great to do, but by the time I did it, <coughs> It didn't have the effect that it used to have, so it did a good set, but nothing. Who was the host? Uh, then Martin wasn't hosting the first time I did it, so you just missed that window. Yeah, like who was the host then? Who was the window? The f- oh, who hosted that episode? I think, oh, what's his name? Joe Torrey, I think, was the host of that show. Joe Torrey was the warm-up. At first, but then he, first, then he, then right, he ended right, right. up being a host. Yeah. When I first started comedy, that was one of the first uh, tapes I got. Oh, right. Like the Best of Death Jam with uh, the kid from Jersey, Bill Bellamy. Bill Bellamy, yeah. And one of the guys is Joe Torrey. And until this day, I just saw Joe Torrey. I always tell him that joke about my brother's a saved the whale type motherfucker. Me, I bought a gun for protection shit. I go to the ATM and I dressed up in a tuxedo with a gun. <laughs> you know, shit like that. I laughed my ass off when I heard that at first. That was one of the first things I bought. I really liked BET. I really yeah. liked that wasn't on BET. It was on HBO. I saw a lot of fucking people on yeah. that blow up a room. But I'm going to tell you who was the most memorable person I ever seen blow up a room on there. Mm-hmm. D.L. Hughley. Oh, okay. As an MC. Right. Which is tough. He just took that fucking room and fucked them up. Fuck them fucking people up to pieces. I had never seen that many people blind. Dog, the best place I ever saw a movie was on 178th Street. Mm-hmm. I was telling Lydia that I went to see Rambo. That movie theater was packed with black people. Rambo 2, 1985. Uh-huh. When he got the Russian and he opens his eyes in the mud. Uh-huh. Dog, black people were <laughs> fucking jumping up and down that movie theater. They uh, were yelling, that white boy's a bad motherfucker. I told you, I told you, <laughs> told you that white motherfucker was bad. Oh, it was hysterical. That's hilarious. I saw him. That's what I saw D.L. Hughley blow up. Uh-huh. He fucking took it apart, man. Yeah, that show, Mad Stars. Mad Stars. Mad Stars. You got on, even if you didn't become a star you'd be on that tour <coughs> you're making money so you know I, I was like seeing people get their shit off on it and it's just dying to get up but i wasn't i wasn't even re- ready then it then yet either you know i was still like working on my shit trying to figure out 
and then finally had a set together and I and I got on, you know, but it was just missed that window. You know? And I did it twice. No Second, sh- yeah, I did it twice. I did it again where it was like an all star show. And that was like now one of them you had dreads on. Like, yeah. Both of them I had dreads on. Both it. of them, okay. One you know. was just, just longer dreads and shit. And then uh did good on that one too, but nothing. The show just just didn't have the power it used to have. Were you disappointed? It's, it's not disappointed. Like if I knew what I knew now, then I could have did something with it. But you you just didn't know you just like you did the set, it's gonna air, I'm gonna get these phone calls. Nothing. <laughs> And there was no social media. <laughs> There's no either. social media either. There was no social There's media. There's nothing you could do. Nothing you could do. Yeah, that's crazy. There was no social yeah. media. Didn't you have a similar experience with the longest jar? Yeah, that's why it's kind of weird when you do something, you're expecting mm-hmm. so much in return, yeah. and nothing happens. And I tell people, that was my breaking point, like eight months after that. Once that movie came out on DVD, mm-hmm. and I was still getting problems with auditions, I, I didn't know how to handle it. Right. I didn't know. And then I see Tracy Morgan on TV after it, and... And fucking the black dude with muscles. That motherfucker scored that movie from that. Like his whole career. Yeah. Terry Crews. Terry, Terry Crews, Cruz. yeah, and, yeah. You know, and here I am living on fucking Schrader in Hollywood and shit. <laughs> back by, uh, what's the Selma. You know, when you're living by Selma, you Selma. get fucked up. Yeah. Shit's not right. <laughs> shady. And that's a shady block. That's a shady fucking block. Not anymore. Stay clean it up. Not anymore. Now they cleaned it up. So now, what CD did you do that Conan produced it? Uh, last year, I did a did my first comedy album, and I was me and my manager. I got a good manager now. His name is Hunter Seedman. Like he, uh, like I said, if I I had managers where, hey man, these people like me and they want to do something, they say, all right, cool, cool, and then they'll never investigate it. Like people who didn't care, or if you did something, and you could make something out of it. You, they just they just didn't care or follow any leads. I don't know what the fuck they were doing. Unless they get the leads, mm-hmm. sometimes they don't want to fuck with it. It's, it's really weird. It's stupid. If they don't know from A to Z, they're like, ah, we called, but the guy sounded fishy. Then you bump into the dude a year later, and you're like, dog, your manager never called me. Right. We didn't think you want to do the project. And you're like, what the fuck are you talking about? Right. Like when I did basketball one day, as the third day I was on the set, they're like, hey, man, mm-hmm. we called the comedy store looking for you for Mafia. Remember they did the movie with Jay Moore, married yeah. the Italian people, like, 98? Mm-hmm. I was pissed. I was pissed. The guy goes, yeah, we called the store twice. We talked to the guy, the Italian coordinator. But by that time, he was fired. Oh, shit. By that time, he was a goofy fucker. He was only there for, like, two months. He was drinking and shit. So Damn. that pisses you the fuck off. Yeah, these are, like, opportunities and shit that, you know, could move you further up the ladder. And you're like, well, you know, fuck it. But... What was the question you asked anyway? I'm no, blanking. so you're on Conan. Dude. So I'm on Conan. So Conan came at me. And I, I guess the reason why, because Conan liked me from before, and I'd done the show three times, and then the third time I did it, they was like, hey, we're planning on like starting a record label, and we're thinking about wanting to know if you were ever recording an album, if you want to do one, and we could talk about doing one with you. And I was like, all right, I'm trying to do one, but this is probably the best place to do it, and I'm... I'm excited and I like the fact that you like me like that, that you want to fuck with me like that. So yeah, I'll fuck with you. Let's do it. And so we taped it in La Jolla at the comedy store and then released it last May. It's called 100% half ass and it's at Team Coco Records. It's dot com. It's like, fuck it. And then now I got to do a special, you know, I got like another hour ready and uh, with all the stuff that some of the stuff you mentioned. And I just got to get that shit together and do it. Because you got to put your content out there. And you got to, I got to get my social, like you guys, you got your social media stuff together. Like I'm, like I'm terrible with that. I got to get better at that. Like this, like this industry is not going to help me. So I got to do as much as I can to help. You me. have an agent? I got a manager, no agent. Writing agent, no literary agent? Nah, my stuff is like referrals. Good and for from you. And from like, like writing on shows and other writers or these young comics getting deals. And they're like, they see me at the store, and they're like, you're a good writer. You're written on shows. You want to work with me? Like, that's how Gerard, you know, hit me up. And he's like, you know, he's, here's a funny story about Gerard. Like, remember when Facebook, MySpace was out? Uh, some people used to hit me up randomly on MySpace. Like, so, you know, because some people see me on Def Jam and them shows, and they hit you up, say, hey, man, I'm thinking about doing comedy. Uh, 
you know, what should I do? And should I move out to L.A. and blah, blah, blah. And I say, yeah, if you want to do it, come on, move out here. And you, when you get here, just hustle and grind and take this thing serious and blah, 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 blah. And Gerard was one of those people that hit me. And I had no idea. He just told me. And we hung out since he got here for a few years. And he just told me maybe this year, hey, man, I was that dude that hit you up on MySpace and you told me to come out here. Isn't that fucking crazy? It's fucking crazy. If you think about it, then he did get something from doing the Def Jam show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just like way later. That's so cool. Yeah. That's true. I've always told you that these little guys are my future. Yeah. These young cats, one of them is going to pop a show and go, I want you to be my uncle. Yeah, your uncle. And the show's going to be a number one hit. And here I was jerking myself the fuck off for years doing (laughs) this and that. And that's how this game works, you know. People try. I learned one thing as a comic. That when you wanted something really bad, mm-hmm. instead of go, like as a comic, you wanted to go to Montreal, right? And then you don't go. Mm-hmm. Well, sometimes you do go, and you're like, all that shit for nothing, right? I put all that shit in for nothing. For years, I wanted to be play Catch a Rising Star. Yeah, yeah. For years, I wanted to play the one in Reno and mm-hmm. Vegas, and I fucking tormented that guy. And he kept telling <laughs> me, no, no, no. I saw your tape, your dirty blah blah. And then one day, I got a call from Jimmy Schubert. Hey, dog, I need a feature for Reno. What the fuck? For years, I've been trying to torture this fucking guy, and now you're going to walk me in there. Hilarious. No tape, no nothing. You know what I'm saying? Like, mm-hmm. everybody has a feature act. They want to see your tape. You never know. That's the best thing about this game. Right. That you never know what the fuck is going to happen. Yeah. I call it entertainment lotto, but the only way you can win is if you keep playing. Every day, yeah. as long as you put your heart into this thing. Like, today, I tell people, on the first of the month, we're all equal. Right. You ain't yes. better than me. I ain't better than you because we're all working for the same dollar. <laughs> so guess what? On the first, we're all the same. Mm-hmm. It's what you do on the second that fucking matters. You right. Know? So, what do you think, cocksucker? How high are you? Look at the shape. <laughs> <of him>. Pretty <laughs> high. Yeah. Look at his face. Look at his face. He got sun yesterday. <laughs> yeah. How the fuck? Next time you go, Jews go to the beach with an umbrella. <laughs> no, we don't. Talk to oh Paul my and God. Get on the fucking boat. Next time, get a little umbrella for you. That'd be nice. This is really interesting, man. I always wanted to have you on. I didn't know this much about you. It's my pleasure, uh, man. You're a gentleman, you know, but what you do on stage, man, is fucking comedy jazz. It's Thanks, just man. A, there's a timing and a smoothness to it. Mm-hmm. And that's it, man. I think you're one of the best working, man. Oh, thanks, man. I've been really fortunate. It. I went back to the store. Mm-hmm. And you guys elevated me. Like, you made me oh, savages right. again because I got to follow you guys. Right. And the last couple of weeks, I, I feel in my heart I've had some of the best comics in there from you and Sebastian. And, mm-hmm. you know, and I didn't see you back then. Joe's known you. And Joe right. raves about you. And I started watching you at the store and going, Jesus fucking Christ. Now I know this guy's game is fucking tight. The writing is a 10. Oh, there's sometimes I sit there and I go, gee, what am I watching? You know, <laughs> And I tell him all the time, I always aspired to that, but I was too lazy. I'll write, but I get too lazy. And mm-hmm. that's just a special gift in comedy. You know, I have high energy. Right. I trick you with the high energy and the mm-hmm. voice and that shit, and you fall for it. <laughs> you know, everybody has smoke and fucking mirrors. You have no smoke and mirrors. So, you know me, dog, I'm on the fucking, uh, I'm on the Ian Edwards fucking... Ship, you're a bad motherfucker. Thanks, man. The story we're I'm kicking is glory. You know what I'm saying? No yeah, more man. rock. Stop! <laughs> a little public enemy, at least I am. What's up with you, Tony? Well, it just, it's crazy because one of the best parts about my job is I get to go to and watch a lot of comedy. And what I've noticed is the best comics are the ones you like remember, like their, their bits. You, if you say their name, you can think of stuff they've said. And when Paula asked me who was on tonight, I thought of like three or four of his bits, and it just, it's a. Uh, I think that's a quality that's like you, you have it too like people remember certain bits that you say because yeah, otherwise it's legendary just, shit otherwise it's just like oh he's a dirty comic or oh he's a clean comic it's boring it's a very interesting life we put together for ourselves yeah every morning I have a little thing and I write my thoughts mm-hmm. after my coffee and shit and there's one thought that always sticks out that uh, I'm happy this thing worked out Mm-hmm. I'm happy that my life worked out. It worked out, you know, uh, uh, whatever. It worked out. Right. You have no idea where I was 20 years ago, 30 years ago. It worked out. 
whatever's going on. You know, the, 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 the walls on the office aren't painted. You know, my car is dirty. It smells like sweat. Right. But everything else worked out, bro. And uh, that's big, especially right. when you come from another country. You took me back tonight with some words that you said because I remember not the pain. It's not a pain that you think about later on in your life. Right. It was just... I never thought I was going to get beat up because I was Spanish. I never thought none of that shit. Right. But I always thought I was a little not worthy. Right. Like, I look at kids and go, ah, you know, I'll never have that. And then, I don't know. I don't know what the fuck I know happens. that feeling. I, you know, that feeling. And, you, yeah. and I know what you were saying where, where you try to fit in. Jesus fucking Christ, how hard is that, you know, yeah. to fit in. And I knew who I was in New York. You know, when I got to Jersey, they just put fucking <laughs> gasoline on me. You know, that was it. Where were you doing comedy in Jersey in those days? Where'd you go to that contest? You said. Oh, uh, that contest! I forgot where that contest was, but I know they had Peppermint Lounge, and that was like a, a crazy place to perform. And there was this other spot named Terminal D, where if you got booked at Terminal D, the two weeks before that show you were ruined because of the fear of having to do that show <laughs> it was a long dark room and you couldn't see the audience and when you went on that stage there was a like two rows from the front there was a cowbell with a long piece of rope it was in the ceiling but the rope was hanging out it was usually like some asshole state troopers sitting at the cowbell table so if you're performing they could just ring that bell and everybody start booing they're like we're done with this nigga <laughs> get him get, get him out so so you have to go there knowing you could get cowbelled uh, I had a friend his name was Pat uh, he's like Pat was like 6 feet 400 pounds he used to lie to me that he was 200 pounds but I didn't know weight back then and uh, and uh, he we, we had a sh- we performed up there one night he went on and his closer is he went to his closer in a second joke. That's how bad he was doing. You know, you do your you do your first joke, no response. So you know, if I do the second joke, that's not as strong as my closer, which is my best joke. I'm gonna get booed. They're gonna ring that cloud bell. So he was so desperate to to win them, he went to his last joke, his closer. And his closer was imagine a 400 pound guy laying across a stool with his arms spread. And his joke was, this is, this is me at the Macy's Day Parade, <laughs> which, is, which is funny, which is funny, but they was not having it. No, 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 so no, no. A 400-pound dude is laying across a stool with his arms spread, and you hear the bell going, bing, 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 bing. It was like the, 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 the embarrassment of like, you, like you, you're selling out for the joke. You're all out. You're, you're spread out. And they're like, nah, nigga. We ain't, we ain't, <laughs> we ain't having It's like that. going to mm-hmm. uh, your favorite team's game, mm-hmm. a championship game. You got their jersey on, they get beat. <laughs> and they get their you got to walk down back to that car with that jersey on. That's yeah. a long fucking That's a, walk, dog. That's mm-hmm. why I don't commit to fucking jerseys, Jack. That's too That's much hilarious. commitment in my fucking world. Fuck you. Hilarious. There was this dude. Who's the really popular black writer in town? Warren Hutchinson? No. John Ridley? No. He writes on a lot of older shows. God, the Fagwa. Uh, there, there's a... a Fagwa or... Antoine Fagwa. No, no Fagua. Ralph Fagwa. Ralph Fagwa. Yeah, yeah. He had an, uh, one of his dudes had a show, an idea about an Italian cop that was a kung fu teacher. It was the worst idea <laughs> I ever heard. He Hilarious. was adamant about it. This brother was a good dude, but mm-hmm. he'd buy me lunch and tell me how this was me, that he could get the meeting set up. Mm-hmm. But I had to go for a tailor and I'm really talking to him because I wanna I want you to walk into the meeting with an authentic Chinese Kung Fu uniform. I said, dog, that's where it stopped. <laughs> I mean the show was so fucking bad. <laughs> But he had great representation. Right, right. So he got me meetings everywhere. His fucking assistant sent me a list one day, and I had like three pitches a day for two fucking weeks. I ain't kidding. Damn. We went every day. After the second day, I told him, come here, listen, I ain't coming no more. Dog. Damn. This is dead. <laughs> this is dead. We already burnt six people. 
I mean, to the point where they didn't even let us finish. Damn. They're like, you know what? We have a 415. Oh, my God. We'll talk. Yeah. We'll call your agent. Nice so to meet you. Bam! It was horrible. All of a sudden, the meeting popped up in the middle of the meeting. It's a, it's yeah. amazing. <laughs> the worst people have the top representation. Like yeah. This guy was like, they love it. He took me there one day. I forget. It was like on Wusha. A lot of fucking yarmulkes. We went in there, dog. He gave it to him. They're like, we love it. You as a kung fu teacher, you work uh-huh. with the mayor, and he, you're vigilante, and you save kids. It was fucking horrible. Hilarious. And they weren't going to let me do it anyway. There's no way. Mm-hmm. No fucking way. Mm-hmm. And he kept saying, you got to wear the kung fu uniform. That'll pull them over. And I'm like, dog. I ain't wearing no motherfucking uniform on the fucking Paramount lot. <laughs> I would never sell out. I'd rather be at the store pushing $15 sets. Right, right. Man, thank you again, my brother. Uh, my Let me pleasure, some man. sponsors, and we'll get, the f- we'll get you the fuck out of here. Number one, as always, the best on it. Went to jiu-jitsu today. Took two fucking on it pills from jiu-jitsu. I went to the fucking North Hollywood Park, and I did some fucking kettlebells. With 10 more pounds. You understand me? I was out there huffing and puffing. And when I got finished with dirt, I put the kettlebell in the trunk of the fucking car. And I brought back with a 15-pound dumbbell. And I proceeded to do uh, sit-ups with all this fucking, uh, what are we talking about here? <laughs> on it. On it. Not on it, but uh, Aqualung. What's the name of this pill? <laughs> Alpha Brain? Uh, Alpha. Shroom Tech. No, Shroom Tech. <laughs> Shroom Tech Sports. I took two of those Shroom Tech Sports. <laughs> And that's how fucking much oxygen I had in my fucking lungs. So if you're lacking with your cardio, you want a little bit more help to stretch them out, the quadricep mushrooms, Shroom Tech Sport is for you motherfuckers. But don't stop there. We base everything on Alpha Brain, 100% money back guarantee. <laughs> that's our bread and butter right there. You ever go to a Chinese restaurant, you don't eat the pork fried rice, they don't give you the money back. They tell you to go fuck yourself and they spit in the fucking soup. That's what I'm saying. Alpha Brain gives you the money back. We don't even want the product back. Do me a favor. Go to onit.com right now and press in. Church. Boom. C-H-U-R-C-H. And get 10% off your first order and just stay on it. They'll mail the shit to your house every fucking month. They'll take it out of your fucking credit card, whatever. Number two, one of my favorites, Hit e cigs. You don't want cancer? You got to go the electronic way, cocksuckers. They got 24, 16, 8 milligrams and zero if you're thinking of quitting smoking cigarettes. And they got one of the best fucking e-cigars on the market. Not only that, 1,200 guaranteed puffs. Joey, stop it. I go to 7-Eleven, I got like eight puffs from those Hindu cigarettes. <laughs> Fuck that. I got hit e-cigs, 1,200 guaranteed puffs. I'm out of puffs. <laughs> 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 I took the wrong one. You know? mm. 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 Who's better than me right now? I'm looking like Sinatra at Universal Studios. You waste go, to hit, go to hitty6.com right now and press in. Joey's Church. And get 20% off. No, your no, no. F- There's the 50 for 5. Oh, shit. Five I'm going to give you 5 for 5. 5 for 50. 5 for 50. <laughs> 5 for 50. They're usually $18. Fuck that. Scratch it. I'm going to give you a whole pack. This is what you're going to do. <coughs> Hold on one second. got to clear out the fucking lungs. You're going to get so the, excited. You're going to get the 0, 8, 16, and 24, and I'm going to give you a cigar for 50 fucking bucks, all right? You're going to be puffing till fucking St. Smidgen's Day. Go to hitty6.com right now and press in. Joey's shirt. Boom! And get a deal 5 for 5. 50. 5 for 50 <laughs> for 50 fucking dollars, all right? Beautiful. 1,200 guaranteed pubs. And also to my goombas. From West New York, New Jersey. Nailed it life, a.k.a. Los Gumis Hermanos. Are you kidding me or what? That's a Jew talking Spanish. Los Gumis Hermanos. What's the webpage? So they go directly. Nailedatlife.com. Nailedatlife.com. Go there and the best vapor pen in the fucking market. They got a ton of other stuff there. You're going to love it. If you're a dab user, if you like losing your mind, listen to music and smoking foreign objects in a fucking pen. They got the fucking best pen on the market for you. You understand me? Why not? You put some fuck. I love smoking foreign objects. Oh my god, I love that glass and all that shit. You smoking those vapor pens? The best vapor pen in the market. They got torches in the car. Go to nailedlife.com right now and press in. Joey Diaz. And get twenty percent off. You understand me? That's how they roll. And let's not forget Iron Dragon TV. Bring you the classic martial art films. Go to Iron Dragon TV right now and press in. Joey. And get two free fucking movies right now on the arm. When was the last time you watched a classic martial arts film? Tell me the truth. 
no, 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 never, cocksucker. You know why? Because <laughs> you're sitting there jerking off. Fuck all that shit. Get into something. Do something with your life. When was the last time you learned about Chinese culture? Them poking eyes and flying through the fucking air on strings. Go to irondragontv.com and press in. Joey. And get two free rentals. Boom, just like that. So I'm giving you two movies. I'm giving you 20% off of Nailed It Life. I'm giving you five for 50 on Hitty's Sakes. And I'm giving you onit.com 10% off your orders. All right, people? I want to thank Ian Edwards for coming on. My pleasure, man. My buddy. main man, Lee Sayah. Where are you going to be? Are you on the road yet? You got a guy booking you on the road? Uh, yeah, I got some spot dates. I'm going to be at Bonnaroo, and uh, I'm going to be at the Montreal Comedy Festival. Just came from Hawaii. And I, uh, what yeah, you I'm, I'm a, Ho- what'd you do in Hawaii? I did a, a this dude named uh, Shane Price, the comic out there. I did like 11, this club called 1144. So I headlined out there. It wasn't a comedy club, but it's was, it was a nice spot. And he put some shows together. And he's got Greg, not Greg, he's got, uh, damn it. Todd Barry coming out there and some other people. I'll put you in contact. Nice, nice. He listens to the whole Death Squad crew and all that okay, stuff. Yeah, great so, that yeah. we go to Hawaii. I'll take yeah. Lee and throw him off the fucking plane. <laughs> you won't take me. I'll take it. I'm telling you, I'm taking you. I'm going to drop you off on an island with big Hawaiians with little dicks with diet pills. You know what I'm saying? I'll chase you around for three fucking days. All right, man. Let's end this motherfucker, Lee. Put some music on. We'll be back Wednesday night, 8 p.m. I love you guys. Thank you for listening. Thank you for Ian Edwards. I love you guys. Stay black. I'm going to be in Denver this weekend, Thursday through Saturday. And then the 18th and the 19th, I'm going to be at uh, Salt Lake City at motherfucking Wise Guys. Did I give shout outs tonight? No, you didn't. No, I did not. What the fuck was I thinking? <laughs> J- loving, dog. Jadida and your dad. I love you. <laughs> Chris Trent and the boys over there fucking making the cars. Lorne Rosica, stand, hang in there. Tom Hortorf. Lorne's a good dude. Yeah, he is. Frank Berdini. Kaye Joe, Ellie O'Neill, Freddie Corrier, Pat Shea, and my main man, Chris Short. Happy birthday, Cogsucker. And that's it. We'll be back Wednesday night for you guys. Thank everybody. Thank Israel. In the morning joint on Periscope. In the morning joint on Periscope. Four days a week, smoking reefer. Dropping you out of the house with inspirational thoughts. You know how I do it. I love you, Cogsucker. Stay black. <laughs>